I rang my mom today. Okay. Because it's her birthday. Um, and I decided what I'd do is I I know they usually have their dinner around half six, and so I was like, you know what? I'll wait till half seven, and I'll 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 ring mom and wish her a happy birthday. But then I did that, and she's like, oh, look who it fucking is. I shouldn't say fucking, but like that was her tone, and she was like, you nearly forgot my birthday, and I was like, mom, what? No, I I'm ringing you. And then dad, who loves to stir shit, he's like, ah, told you, told you he'd nearly forget. And I'm like, but I I didn't forget. I didn't. And she's like, yep. Well, he was expecting to call call first thing this morning. And nothing is, is that crazy? Like, I don't understand. No, no. Your mom is absolutely does the thing what my mom does. So whenever it's my mom's birthday, I have to be in there with a call before 12 or she thinks I forgot. Oh God. Dad, I just, why? I, it's like Mother's Day in two days. I'm giving her a ring at fucking six a.m. and see how she likes that. You should That's a good just move. do it. Um, yeah. My mom is a twin, so I'll usually send my aunt a message before my mom because she's my godmother. What? And it Why? just winds my mom up. Oh, you're doing it to enrage your mother. Yeah. Well, she's already angry anyway, so what's what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> That's kind of how I get with my mom. When she gets, like, pissed, I'm like, well, I'm fucking in it now, so why even try yeah. to slow this crazy train down? Welcome to the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast the world's strongest video game podcast i am sitting here with two of the most quarantined people in all of dublin although we say that it's probably not right to my left barricaded behind several metal doors it's neve hi everyone to my right no amount of yellow caution tape is enough. It's Brian. I maintain social distancing the entire time. And with you always, I am your host. I'm your, I'm your host, John. Hey, John. Hey, Neve. Hi, Brian. Wait, wait, I thought that'd be worse. Hi, John. Um, I say to my, I say to my left and to my right. That's actually a lie because, um, for the first time ever, we are recording this podcast over the internet. And it feels so fucking weird. Yeah, I'm I, I'm here where we usually record, surrounded by empty chairs. Yeah, uh, the coronavirus is in full effect in Ireland. They don't recommend you go outside except for like non. What's it? Non critical. Yeah, non non critical endeavors. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like, I I when did this kind of sink in with what's happening Ooh, um i don't know monday for monday Tuesday? this week yeah yeah um for me it was like maybe friday evening and then i didn't oh. leave the house at all till now yeah until now where i've no i'm still at home um i've been out twice just to get some milk that's about it yeah um Honestly, like, it, like the the way things worked out for me was super weird because, like, it was announced like, not like not a state of emergency, but like the the declaration that we all have to stay indoors was like last Thursday, and that was weird because I had a wedding to go to Friday, I had to travel a couple of hours to get down to the south of Ireland to go to a wedding, and so they announced that, and it was like, oh well, I guess, I I guess the wedding's off. And then I get a message from a man being like, wedding's still on, we're going. And I'm like, ah. Okay. Um, yeah. And so it was meant to be a wedding of 270 people. I think it ended up being maybe 50 people. Oh, who got cut? Um, I don't know, but I'm baffled I didn't. Like, I was kind of like, oh, that's sweet. But also like, for fuck's sake, <laughs> you know. It's like either um, you're, they're her favorite people or they want to infect you. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's 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 probably the second one, but like it was weird because like I was down in like Skibbereen, Brian, you know Skib. I do. I know Skib very well. Uh, Southwest and Ireland. I forgot what a fucking backwater ass little village that was. At one point, I went out looking for a for somewhere I could buy a Switch game. Long story. Don't want to talk about it. And there was one place, I went into a computer store and I was like, do you guys sell switches? And you would think I asked for like, like plutonium. They were like, oh, switch, she'll have to go to Cork City for that. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, they used to sell them in like ExtraVision and like video rental shops, but then they all closed down. Yeah, ExtraVision's And so closed. I think a lot of the backwater towns kind of got, that was it. They have nothing. There's an over Christmas. I was looking an, for a switch, and I went to one of the bigger towns in Offaly, and I went to just three shops, and some guy was just like, "What the hell is a switch?" And I was like, "Oh, oh god, that's so nuts." Um, it was bizarre. Like the hotel I was at was nearly completely empty. Um, I saw some people at breakfast the next morning, but other than that, like it was just, it was weird. Like you couldn't hear anything it was just dead silence um and then the wedding like the wedding ended up being fun but it was real like you know seeing cousins you haven't seen for like five years and being like oh oh do do we oh (laughs) and then like you just end up like banging shoes yeah yeah it was strange um it's weird i'm not sure i like this whole coronavirus thing in all honesty no, it doesn't seem the best. No, it, no, it doesn't. I was thinking maybe for next year. No, thank you. Yeah. No, it's definitely not the best start to a new decade. I know. Today, yeah. um, my bungee Australian Fire um, t-shirt arrived. So Bungie Destiny did a t-shirt where all the proceeds went to the firefighters in Australia. And I ordered that at the end of January, where that was the big... Oh no, the fucking world is on fire, Australia. Yeah. And now it is the whole world, but it's with germs. Uh, that, and that's kind of the crazy thing about it. Like, I've never experienced anything where, like, everyone is so equally, well, not equally affected, because obviously, like, there's massive discrepancies in how much money people have. But I mean, by, like, how geographically people are worrying about the exact same shit. Yeah, like, you know? Yeah, for yeah. Exa- yeah, totally. Like, Australia was just like, oh, God, that's so horrible for everyone in Australia. But, like, now you hear New Yorkers, you hear Italians, you hear Germans all talking about the same thing, you know, and the same social isolation and what to do. It's it's really strange to be very globally connected for a global pandemic. Yeah, and I think kind of especially for us in a way because a lot of the times when we're hearing a lot about a specific problem it's usually like America centric Mm. you know like it'll be like some you know violence it'll be um, you know forest fires kind of a a lot of different stuff like that and there's always this layer of abstraction to it but that layer is gone now because we're experienced like I can turn on to an American podcast recorded you know 3,000 miles away and hear them worrying about the exact same stuff I'm worrying about and it's so strange it's super it strange and in its weirdest way it's a tiny bit comforting to know that like like I get no comfort from like knowing that Tom Hanks is sick like what the fuck ever he's a celebrity it'll be fine but the podcaster people like you know our peers in that situation I'm like oh god is Abby Giant Bomb safe is she safe? Why, why hasn't she been on in three weeks? What's what's? Is she okay? But then she was on today and it was fine. Yeah, she was just busy. <laughs> she was yeah. on holidays, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, she was. So you both work from home, anyways. Uh, so you would be predominantly home for the most part. But and I, I know for myself at the weekends, I'd spend a lot of time indoors. But I think what's kind of getting to me is that we have no control over it anymore. Like, we can't go out now, even if we wanted to, because we shouldn't. Mm-hmm. What I'm finding is, like, I really miss my friends, like, 
you two included. And it's odd because, like, I wouldn't have necessarily seen you. What are you fucking shaking your head at me? <laughs> Just you two included. Thank you. Thanks for throwing us in well, there. Well, like, uh, obviously. <laughs> well, I did. Yeah, I'm, obviously. I'm, I'm putting on video. I'm putting on video just to look Thanks, at Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Okay, so what's happening now is that Neve and Brian are so bad at emotional intimacy that whenever they hear genuine affection, they're like, oh! <laughs> um, but no, like, I, I, I genuinely do. And it's weird because, like, you know, we could go two weeks without seeing each other easy. Like, that's pretty typical. Yeah. But I guess knowing that the option to hang out isn't really there, like... There's a big difference between that and just not seeing each other because we have other plans. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, totally. Yeah. And and that kind of gets to me. Like I find like I find myself missing all my friends with this added layer of kind of social oppression on it. And that's probably a terrible way of putting that, but you know what I mean? It really sinks in over a few days. Like, do you remember how at the beginning of the week we thought like, okay, we'll we'll uh, do our few days at home and then we'll you know, because it's only the three of us. See you guys Friday. Yeah, see you guys Friday for recording because it's only three of us. But now it's just kind of like such a behavior that we need to kind of keep up now with the distancing and the isolation Mm -hmm. that it's just (laughs) part of our routine, even if we don't like it. Yeah, it's strange. It's really, really weird. Um, Yeah, I think like Wednesday... Is when it really started it sunk in for me because like the wedding was done i was back in dublin i was back in my home and then i just kind of realized oh god like this could be it for a while and oh, it's such a weird feeling um i think i think like you know we we really wanted to like record this podcast anyway because i think now is the time when people need to be entertained god damn it yeah oh totally um, I'm very, very uh, happy for everyone that Doom and Animal Crossing came out today. I think it was what a lot of people needed. And I'm very happy yeah. for myself that Resident Evil 3 demo came out the other day, because that's what I needed for myself. So it's like, I feel like there's going to be such a drop everywhere else, but there's going to be such a boom with media consumption the pirates are working overtime to get the hunt invisible man and emma up on torn sites <laughs> you better fucking believe it i'm, I'm I, I am refreshing that page yeah um it's weird uh i feel awful for just the people like losing their jobs as well uh, my cousin is a personal trainer and he's like my job is gone it just it doesn't exist anymore Mm. and i think that's fucking terrible and you know really sorry to anyone who's kind of having to you know listen to this podcast and having to deal with that right now um we will do what we can to make the next two or so hours a little lighter as light Um, as we can manage there is a pandemic yeah Yeah. (laughs) we yeah we can't we we unfortunately we can't promise promise no miracles here and if i sound a little disgusting i'm sorry guys I actually have symptoms of the coronavirus and I'm waiting for a test. So uh, if I sound gross and if I'm coughing, I'm definitely doing it into my el- uh, my elbow. What's the inside of your elbow called? It, my pocket glove. My cough yeah, glove. Yeah, your, your cough glove. What did... I, <laughs> There's something disturbing about that. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Calling any part of the body a glove is kind of gross. Or a pocket. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that I, I don't I don't jive with that. I've got very big um, earlobes and and uh, to me they're like my little pockets that can catch uh, raindrops. That's both disgusting and beautiful, Brian. Thank you. The human Brian, body. Brian, sometimes uh, sometimes you say shit and I, I just I just want to shove you in a locker. That's fine. I'll see you in there. <sighs> Brian. Yes. Talk to me about Devs. Devs is a television show made by Alex Garland, who made Annihilation and that other movie starring Oscar Isaac and Donald Leeson that I can't remember. Ex Machina. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. And uh, Devs, uh, I think there's like three or four episodes out of Devs, and it is a show about... Um, a tech company in San Francisco that have a supercomputer 
uh, thing. It's really ambiguous what they have. It 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 it's a quantum machine that has an algorithm that can tell what's happened and what's going to happen. And it is a sort of thriller slash kind of revenge story about a woman whose partner uh, kind of gets promoted into the devs department of this company, uh, mysteriously disappears, and it's her trying to figure out what happened to him, and she has a good hunch about what happened, and the mystery around everything, I guess. That sounds and cool. Nick Offerman's in this, is he? Uh, he is. Nick Offerman plays the uh, CEO of the company, and he's, like, the richest man in the world, but he just, like, looks real, like, he just looks like a lumberjack, and he lives in, like, a very small suburban house and drives a station wagon. It's very cool. Is it funny, Brian? Or is it, it has like, a, kind of freaky annihilation existentialism? Okay, it's got that, and it's very dry, but it has a sense of humor. Like, I think it's in the second episode, there's a bit where the main girl, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head, I think it's Lily, I'm not sure, uh, but I'll I'll get, get to the actress in a second. Um, but her ex-boyfriend is playing Dark Souls, and he dies, and then he goes, oh, I died. And it turns out that the director of the show, Alex Garland, just really, really likes Dark Souls. I wanted Dark Souls to be in the show. That isn't really a joke. <laughs> that's a cool tidbit, though, but that doesn't make it funny. <laughs> that's okay. Well, that's as funny as it gets, and, it, and it'll oh. make you smile when you see it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for this show, that is a joke. Yeah. Um, okay, the characters, cool. so, you know, like in Annihilation, the characters are very, very distant and kind of blunt with each other. But then there are sparks of, like, raw emotion and, like, they are acting the hell out of it. Mm. But for a lot of it, you're kind of like, do these people even like each other? Because they're, like, barely talking to each other about surface level shit. But I think that's just how the characters are written. And and you're enjoying it, Brian? Yeah, no, no. It, it's, it, it's a really interesting show. It kind of feels a bit like... Um, do you remember in Watchmen last year and there was... Um, the uh, tech company in that. What? 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 What was the name of it again? The oh, one. Oh, that... Lady Truths one. I can't remember yeah. the name of the company. It's a very similar vibe to just that stuff with Lady okay. True. Um, and the main actress in it, um, she's a ballerina. She's a she's she she's danced in loads of music videos, and she was the dancing alien at the end of Annihilation that could like mimic your moves. Oh, cool. Uh, I think her name is Sonia Mizuno. I think that's her name. Um, but she plays the lead in this, and she's fantastic. That's awesome. Cool. Sounds like good quarantine viewing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've realized recently that I need to watch more than The Sopranos during the quarantine, because it's just, it's just getting to me a little. Yeah, yeah you, need you to have to that have stuff a... up. You yeah, need yeah, to go yeah, through yeah, totally. all the human emotions in, for, in forms of media. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's time to break out Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> I bet it's that's... just been a long time, and I need to know if it's still good. Look, there's Oops. a lot of great stuff in Buffy. Buffy's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back to it. Neve, you've been watching I Am Not Okay With This. Yeah, this is this was a surprise for, to me, because it's, like, it's a Netflix original. It's from the producers who did... Uh, what am I thinking? Mm, mm, mm. Stranger Things. So it has that teen vibe, of that kind of teen nostalgia vibe. And I kind of don't like that stuff. And even if I did like it, I'm so done with it now. I'm kind of like, I don't need to see any more of this kind of stuff. But I put it on and I was completely blown away by how brilliant a show this is. Uh, uh. First thing first, um it's very easy to watch it's seven episodes and they are 20 minutes to 30 minutes and it's a kind I, I, of I, I, I i've watched it too it's very very digestible yeah it's like it's something like it does not take long to get through the season and you could leave like it doesn't need a second season it sets up one but you absolutely don't need one it's it's contained which 
the way Netflix like to cancel things, it's kind of nice to be able to go into something and watch it and know what if they never touched it again or they canceled it all of a sudden, you haven't kind of wasted that time. Like the OA feels like such a waste of watching time because it was leading to something. But this is nice and contained. Um, This is kind of a coming of age story and it's about a 17 year old girl called Sydney Novak who is dealing with anger issues. She goes into school and shitty things happen. People kind of bully her, friends kind of ditch her, home life is hard, her dad is not no longer in the picture, he, uh, he committed suicide and she's trying to deal with this trauma, as well with her mom working overtime to try and, you know, survive. So she's dealing with anger and she has a lot of anger and it's a lot of teen rage and it's portrayed really well. But every time she gets angry, she noticed that maybe she might move something. Maybe there's some telekinetic powers going on. Maybe a door will slam shut or maybe it'll progress even more and she might think she killed the family pet. Or maybe she didn't and it was just a coincidence. So this kind of progression of power keeps going and going on and this kind of examination of kind of anger keeps kind of building and if you think of the word repression to me I think of two genres and it's LGBT cinema and it's horror and this is a perfect little horror series I think all the way through it you might think it's like a coming of age kind of drama and it definitely is that but by the end of it you realize you're watching a horror and it's a really really good one I thought um, the performances in it for me were what really sold it I think uh, especially like the the two lead girls are like fantastic. Oh, yeah, they're great. Yeah, they're the acting is great. This is like Sophia Lillis. I think that's her, how you pronounce her name. She's the girl from It, Bev. So it's nice to see her have kind of more of a role. Mm. Yeah. Um, the I re- other girl as well, her her like it's love interest. Like, yeah. She's really, really good as well. Sophia yeah. Bryant, I think, is the actress and her the character's name is Dina. Um, I really, really like her voiceover and how, like, she really, really wants to say one thing, but she doesn't. And she just sort of says whatever she feels just to, like, you know, to please the other person. And it has a really, really nice comedy timing to it. Yeah, there's, like, moments yeah, totally. of great humor in this. It's really, really good. But, yeah, that internal monologue really kind of gives away the teenness of it, where she's kind of like, I'm just going to do this, and I'm so sick of being treated this way. And then it cuts to what really happens and she kind of lets people walk over her or she kind of gives in way easier or, you yeah. know. Yeah, really, really good little series. Uh, I like that it reminded um, me so much of Carrie. That's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, Brian, tell us about Lego Masters. Okay, Lego Masters is my kind of like very special treat that I watch uh, once a week. And it is a, I guess, a baking competition show, but instead of them baking a cake, they have to make Lego. That's class. Okay, I didn't know what this was. I thought we were dealing with a kind of Lego movie, the TV show kind of thing. Great. Okay, go on. Okay, so I guess I guess it's like Ready, Steady, Cook. Um, and you have... Uh, teams of two people and i think there's like eight teams or maybe it's 10 some number like that anyway and it's hosted by uh will arnett who was job in arrested development but he also voiced lego batman and so they have him as in as kind of like the host with attitude but whenever people get too emotional about lego he knows to back (coughs) off and let them fucking like cry because like these people take Lego way serious. Like, like it, it, it is, it is their fucking life. That's it. What's this on, Brian? Uh, is there... uh, the internet. <laughs> I just got it. Okay, gotcha. It's just called Lego and... Masters, and you go on a special website where you watch it. Okay, cool. Say no more. That sounds perfect. Uh, and so, what it is is uh, each week they get a theme. And so, for example, the first episode it's a fun fair. And the way they do it is they have uh, full access to an entire library of Lego bricks and accessories. And they have, I think it's like 16 hours to build their 
set and what they have is they have like a big like one meter by one meter lego tile you know fully bricked out and they just stack their bricks up on that and then what they do is because the tables are on wheels then they move all the tables back in and they make the full segmented like design um and so so are they working together or are they competing they're all competing but it has to all kind of like work together as a big master so i guess for the fun for episode one 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 team takes the ferris wheel another team takes like the um the like the like big drop things like that right and, and people have they... different ways of go sorry oh, go how on. did they like grade this like is it just okay like... so okay so the two judges are Lego masters already in that they already work in Lego and they design Lego products and oh. um, I think they have the people that I'm not sure what they've done recently but like there are definitely some of the people who've done like the more recent licensed stuff so they might have like created original bricks but then they would have had to have um, designed um, uh, designed kind of like using the resources that are already in Lego and making that work into a believable product. But they're very much against, like, don't ever make, like, a blank wall. You have to, like, texture it out mm. so it looks more believable. So is and that so, something that gets people sent home doing a blank wall? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, you really, really have episode. to be, like, a sculptor in Lego. Um, but then, but then, what they do as well is because it's Lego and because you know it's it, it, it's kind of like half sculpture, half architecture. What you have to be building as well has to have a function. So for the fun for episode, they all had to have a ride, but it had to work as a ride as well. So the Ferris wheel had to rotate and be able to rotate without anyone like 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 you know touching it or cranking it. So they had like lots of battery powered like uh, gears and stuff. Um, that's mad, but I feel like that's out of the the realm of Lego nearly a bit. That's getting into some Connect stuff. It is, putting but then, power into it. but then some of the like things people make look like actual Lego sets that could exist. It's it's wild. Um, but then the people themselves who are the contestants, you just have this really unusual mix of like predominantly Americans, I guess. But like a lot of them look like they're from a Portlandia sketch, and they and like because it's a reality TV show, everything is like hammed up and overly edited, and they use footage out of context and stuff like that. But there are some scenes where people are screaming, "I just don't think you fucking understand Lego anymore," and things like that. Oh my god! Okay, I'm downloading this. Yeah, um, and like the people in it, like it, like to me, it's a very good show for like people watching. But like the actual Lego is so impressive um, that it's just, it, it's a very fun and exciting show and, and I'm very glad it exists. Cool. Brian, that sounds amazing. Bri yeah, Brian? I, I'm here. I'm sorry. This is so weird. I, I'm, I'm not able to read. I, maybe, maybe I will put on the camera. Just bear bear with us here, folks. We're 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 working out some stuff. I, I, yeah, it, it's 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 very strange not having facial cues. Yeah. Yes. I feel I our natural back. flow is really disrupted, but hey, we'll make it work. Yeah. This. Hey, hey, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Neve, tell us about M O M. <laughs> this is Mom, Mothers of Monsters, and maybe not another fun one. <laughs> I always watch horror when I feel bad or when I feel sick. Like, I always watch stuff that could possibly make you feel worse, but I find it, I don't know, kind of cathartic. But uh, this one was I think a sad. lot of times I'm like, ah, oh. oh, really? Yeah, a little. <laughs> um, I'll tell you about it. So Mother of Monsters is about a mom. It's a found footage horror film. So it's about a mom who suspects her teenage son, who's 16 year old, this is 16 years old, might be planning a school shooting and yeah it's really dark so her son is a typical or maybe atypical kind of angry teenager he likes his video games he likes his metal music he's spending a lot of time in his room he's kind of belligerent and she is convinced that all these signs are kind of leading to maybe something worse and she's been trying to get help but she feels that people are 
kind of pushing it to the side and not taking her seriously. So she decides to secretly film her son to see if he, you know, will outwardly act. And the idea is that she's going to upload it to the internet so other moms who are worried about their kids can kind of see this footage and they can kind of build a community about it. So that's kind of the the conceit for why there's loads of found footage. All the all the cameras in the house are her hidden cameras. So the angles kind of make sense for a hidden camera, but they kind of look nice aesthetically as well. But there's also uh, Skype calls and stuff like that. Um, and it's it's a really sad kind of film. It starts off with then the two of them fighting because it's just a mom and a son who cannot communicate. And she's angry at him because she's like, you cut all the heels off my shoes. And he did it because he hates the sound of them and he's just angry and he did it to hurt her. And he was just like, no, you came in drunk and you destroyed your own shoes to be angry at me. And you never find out the truth of this. But the two of them feel completely victimized from each other and they completely cannot communicate with each other and they just do things consistently throughout it to hurt each other and demean each other in a way that felt real but also heightened for the horror element of it. But there was some really mean, mean bits where his mom, obviously not so very tech savvy, thinks she's on a Skype call for him and he starts calling her an idiot. He's like, you're an idiot. This is a re- pre-recorded thing. You can't see a little screen down in the corner. You're not talking to me. And then she starts to like cry a little and he goes, no mom, no mom, it, it, it's live. It's actually live. And then he goes, you fucking idiot. You believe that too, you know? So there's this real psychological warfare through technology till by the end, they're both trapped in different rooms for a reason I won't spoil, but they're only communicating through camera because they both know they've been filming each other. And it's, it, it's, uh... it's sad, it's dark, it's timely, it's scary. You're going to either love it or hate it. I feel it. bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll love it or hate it. I thought it was great. And it's something I've continuously thought about. By the end of it, I wasn't like, I don't think that's the best horror film I've ever seen. But it, it you know, it made me think, you know. How Ooh, how yeah. good is the acting? Like, like how uh, convincing are they as like a, a, a as, as a troubled like relationship? He's brilliant. He's yeah. the, the the son is brilliant. He he does some stuff to hurt to hurt himself to hurt her. That is that looks painful and upsetting and very real. Like like he's extremely good. She I think has a harder role because she had kind of has to kind of oscillate between I'm telling the truth to you, but I'm also like maybe I'm an unreliable narrator kind of thing. Uh, but she do- also does a great job, and between the two of them, like like it's their film, like it's just the two of them together. There's some other side characters, but they carry it and they do a great job of it. It sounds good. I want to check it out. Yeah, that sounds like it'll really ruin your day. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, guys. Strategy talk. Okay, guys, I played World of Horror. No, oh. you played this ages ago. Yeah, I played the demo ages ago. Oh, mm-hmm. it just released recently, and it was interesting because, like, the way the demo worked, it was like this tiny mini episode of it. You go to a school. There is a woman with a scissors killing people in the school, and you got to figure out what she is and how to stop her and it's all done as if it's like a very old like not even point and click adventure but they're like at nearly a text-based adventure except it does have like a lot of imagery in it but like it's a lot of like looking at static screens and being asked a question so like you'll start and your options will be like investigate school and like so you'll be in your room so it's just a static picture of a room of there'll be a statics picture of like your room and you'll be able to like watch TV, uh, take a bath, you know, go to and then like investigate school, which is like go to school and like try and figure out this thing. That's how the whole thing plays out. And I was interested to see what this game actually was because the demo was just like one episode, this thing with the with the scissors woman. But the entire game itself is kind of it is 
more interesting than the demo, but also more flawed. It's a much bigger scope. So this is kind of like a roguelike. So when you start up the game, there's five randomly selected mysteries, okay? And one of them could be this woman at the school. One of them could be a haunted ramen shop. Another could be like a mysterious mansion that's appeared in the center of town. Another one might be mermaids, you know? Okay. It's like all these fucked up things are happening around the town and it seems to select five random missions from um, from like a pool of missions and you can tackle them in any order you want. And I'd say the missions take anywhere between like 10 and 20 minutes to do. And they're full of these like multiple choice things. So like say for the Scissors Woman one, you know, you might go investigate school and then that gives you an event where you meet a mysterious woman in the hallway. She wants you to follow, she wants you to follow her into the biology classroom. And then like if you do, and then you can choose to do that. And if you do, you might have to like do a charisma check or something, in which case you'll convince her to be on your side or you might fail the charisma check or you could just avoid her altogether. But there's no guarantees about what's gonna happen. Like, it's the kind of game where it's constantly rolling checks to see what your outcome is. And it's very difficult to know what's going to happen unless you've played the missions a couple of times. Um, and this was made by one guy. This was made by a Polish dentist and he has this like really lo-fi style of pixel art. And the art direction in it is so strong that like I, I would go so far as to say is I don't think this game would art work if the art wasn't so good and like I'd encourage people I'd, I'd encourage people just to look up stills of it like it looks incredible um, and it's fun but it's also the kind of thing where you know the way you play some indie games sometimes and you're like um, maybe it's made by one person and it doesn't feel like it this absolutely feels like it's one person in where you can see that there's some missions that just didn't get the polish that other missions did. There's UI problems where you're sometimes, at any point there can be like up to 20 different buttons you can click at once. And like, you know, they all do different things and it's logically laid out so you'll figure out which one to do, but it's not intuitive, you know, that kind of way. Do you think if it wasn't a roguelike and this was more of a structured narrative kind of thing where it didn't kind of rotate through the missions that that would be kind of alleviated in some way because you kind of maybe you could have axed the weaker missions kind of thing yeah yeah i think so and i respect it because like what he what they've done is made something really very interesting and very different to anything that else that's being that's out right now you do have to like take its flaws with that and like there are some missions that like i found a little boring but then like the good ones were great you know and like the actual horror, and like, very little of it is like, you know, deep-rooted psychological horror. A lot of it is very, like, it's it's gross-out horror, or it's just unsettling horror, or unsettling ideas, but they're good ideas, you know? Um, there's one, like, where the ramen shop, you're like, um, oh, why are people so addicted to this crazy ramen? And I was like, is the ramen people? It's not. It's something else, but what, what it is was unsettling and weird and I was like oh I don't like that like I was like oh that's fucking bad but like it was good in terms of like being a weird horror thing um and I've been having a good time there like it's awkward but not in a way that I don't think could eventually I hope they keep working on this game and supporting it because I think you could patch this game to be like absolutely amazing as opposed to just like pretty good cool um yeah, it, it's it's really really cool and like um, yeah, just just the art style, like some of the imagery on it from it is fantastic. And um, it's interesting the way this overall structure works because sometimes events can happen in one mission that affect affect events in other missions. Like um, in one mission, I found a cursed idol and I brought it home and I put it in my apartments, and it was just like you know the text comes up on screen. You shouldn't have done that. And then like, you know, a couple of, then like, you know, a couple of events later, the text just came up, something evil has found out about you. And then a couple of screens later, something evil knows where you live. And then a couple of event, ev events later, something evil is coming for you. And like, it really did a good job of building up this tension. And then when the evil thing finally got to me, yeah, it was really fucked up and it was cool. And it's just, it's a really, this is a really interesting horror game, and I'm very glad it exists. It's not what it said, it's downsides, but like I'm I'm having a good time with it. That's great. Yeah. 
Brian. Yes. Are you having a good time with folklore? Oh my god. Okay. Um, so because it's well, it's it's just gone past St. Patrick's Day, but uh, I wanted this march to kind of look into some weird Irish bullshit, and so I remembered this game called Folklore, which came out during the first year of the launch of the PlayStation 3. So this game came out mid-2007, so it's about 13 years old now, and um, it was kind of one of the launch window games for the PlayStation 3, one of the first kind of JRPGs, I guess, but it's not really an RPG, like a full RPG, but I guess it would have been like a game that they would have pushed at the beginning of the console's life cycle. And, uh, it sure looks like it. It sure looks like it. So it looks like a very nice PlayStation 2 game. And um, the first year or two of the PlayStation 3, they had the six-axis motion controller, and uh, this game uses those features. But yeah, Folklore is a JRPG, and it's a, it, it, it's definitely a Japanese game. It's, it was made in Japan by a company that no longer exists called Game Republic. And oh, did they make something after this, or was this their last game? Um, okay, so they made Folklore in 2007, and they made uh, Dragon Ball Origins, Catan. Uh, oh. They made a bunch of... I, I think they helped out on a bunch of Dragon Ball games for the Nintendo DS. And they made okay. Clash of the Titans. I was just kind of sad that the idea that like the Irish made Japanese game is the one that sunk them, but it wasn't that. No, um, they made the Genji games. They made Genji Dawn of the Samurai and Genji Days of the Blade. If anybody knows what those are. Brian, do you remember I told you about Dominic Wheel? Uh... He was the strange man I made films for for a time. Yes. He used to love Genji. Of course he did. Yeah. Because of what happened in that flat. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Sorry. I just just a bunch of stuff. I, I I do you know do you know when you said that guy's name, I thought you meant the other guy that was cosplaying as Albert Wesker that I had to take the photos of. But that's a different story. Oh the yeah. I, have we told that before? No, we have not told the story about Sorry, Carmine. Okay. But we will yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. But yeah, we will we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> Sorry, Neve. It's okay. She, she's folklore. she's doing her. <laughs> okay, uh, folklore is it's a it, 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 I, I guess it's a light JRPG uh, in which you play as two different protagonists. Um, uh, throughout, throughout each chapter, I've gone with the female protagonist, whose name I think is Aileen. Aileen. Um, we'll go with Aileen. Ellen. That's more Irish. No, I, I, I sorry. Her name is Ellen, but sometimes they call her uh, Aileen or Aileen because oh, I don't no. know what they're going for. The voice acting... So the two main voice actors are from Northern Ireland, I think, or at least the female voice actors from Northern Ireland. I think maybe the male guys from the UK, but they were both in that show, The Fall, with Gillian Anderson and the sexy serial killer guy. Really? Yeah. And so, like... The voice acting is pretty good, and, like, there are some funny Irish accents in it, but the two main leads, like, their Irish voices are pretty legit. Um, but you end up on this island on the west coast of Ireland, and it's called Doolin, and you are investigating a supernatural mystery. Um, if you play as the female lead, you are returning to Doolin, because that's where your family is from, and you are... Uh, and Samhain is approaching, and you must uncover the mystery of your lineage. And ah, yes. What, We've all been there. And so I guess the core gameplay is you walk around your hub town, which is just a tiny Irish village, and it looks pretty legit for something that looks like Bally Go Backwards. Uh, and I wonder, like, did a bunch of Japanese game developers actually go to the west of Ireland and take a bunch of photos for, re uh, for research? Um, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, and, and, and then the other side of it, which I guess is the main part of the game, is that you're going around above ground tunnels and it's kind of like a dungeon crawler. And you're just kind of going deeper and deeper into the netherworld as you uncover the mysteries while encountering the folklore, which are just different types of Irish monsters and deities. 
and it's kind of yeah, like so Ireland, Ireland. Yeah. yeah, and so I guess it's and is there like fantasy elements to it or yeah, but it's more like it's more like Pokemon or uh, Digimon or something like that, where it's like a monster catcher and battler, where you don't okay. catch them with any device, but you do defeat a monster, and if it's the first time you defeated that monster, then you have it as a weapon to attack future monsters with. And is the is the combat like turn based or what are we talking? Uh, it's like a really shitty uh, uh, hack, hack and slash. Fantastic. Oh. Yeah, it's it's not very fun to play, but you know how I mentioned it has motion controls. So what you do is when you have weakened an enemy uh, folk, um, he will be on the ground <laughs> lying, and then what you do is you uh, gesture your controller up and down in a very vigorous way. Until, baby. oh no, you're not rocking it. You are, <laughs> you are straddling it, <laughs> and until eventually you capture its essence back into you, and you really, really have to go like all over the place with the motion controls. It's not like a very casual flick. You need to be like really fucking like churning that butter. <laughs> you are struggling. Yeah, you are, and I'm not sure if that's you guys. No, go on. Do you guys have any instance of motion controls you really like? Uh, I kind of love the gimmicks. I really liked, like, in Second Son, where you had to do the spray paint and you had to hold the controller sideways and use the trigger button as the can spray. Like, that <laughs> yeah, was pretty okay, good. Okay. I, I, I loved uh, No More. Sorry, Brian, you go ahead. No, I like, like, for me, it's just gyro controls in, like, the Switch. I don't mind. But I don't really. Want I loved to do... Suplex in. Um, I loved Suplex in Guys and No More Heroes. Yeah. It's like you'd beat them up, and then you'd have to like yank the controller up as if you were, you know, suplexing them, and that always felt good to me. And then like you'd have to do the same. You'd like beat the shit out of people, and then it would go into slow motion and tell you to swing the control right, and then it would like you'd do it. But they timed it in a way that it actually felt kind of good whenever you did it. Like I, I, I really liked that, and nothing else. <laughs> I like the Death Stranding rocking the baby just for how weird it is. Like, that's just weird. It's... Sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's a thing. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, I wish this game was more fun to play because all the cutscenes and all the Irish stuff is really fascinating. Where, like, they're, like, it's almost right, but then they'll do some, like, anime bullshit where you're like, ah, oh, come on now. Um, like, there's a bit where she's going into, like, the netherworld for the first time and she has, like, a full-on Maha Shoujo like outfit change where she gets oh. changed into like a sexier version of her current outfit just for Did no she reason. Should we more again? Um I, I like so far all the like creatures I've encountered are like like they're they're kind of based on other like folklore and deities but like they had kind of have their names a bit messed up. Some are oh. accurate, some aren't. Um I've met a banshee, she's very nice. She hangs out in the pub and she has a parasol. That's very on banshee like, yep. but okay. Yeah. <laughs> she she she's less of a banshee and more of like a woman in white, like a bride that never married. Does she have long hair? Is she that she's combing? Nope. She has long hair, wow. but it's not combed. But then like but then they're like just nice NPCs. A lot of the other folklore are just like monsters that just growl at you, like they don't actually talk. And there's a lot of like elf looking leprechaun dudes that just all look the same and it's just a copy paste of the same character they should put Irish the Hedgehog in there I don't want Irish the Hedgehog anywhere yeah yep yep fuck that thing yep anyone who tags us in the... that like just borderline offensive just yeah just <laughs> fucking bullshit <laughs> Oh, I hate the buckles on its little fuck. Uh, the fucking. Sh mm. Me and Brian have already been very angry about this, but it's not a four-leaf clover. It's a shamrock. They have three leaves. It's a different fucking leaf. <laughs> it's a different plant. We like good cath. We like good Catholic fucking plants here. I really, I really want to take Irish head, Irish the hedgehog out the back and hit it over the fucking face with a shillelagh. Like fuck that thing. Oh, and it's a fucking obnoxious voice. So folklore is good, is it, Brian? Uh, I wish it was better. I'll keep playing it, but it's a slog. But it, it's it's not a very long game. Like, it's less than 20 hours, which is pretty short for a JRPG. 
It's Do you think you'll beat it? I want to. I don't know if I will, but I'd really like to. Yeah. Neve. Yes. I Resident Evil 3 demo came out. Yes, and I've been playing it. I finished it multiple times. Same. And I'm having a great time. Um this is cool it's kind of the demo that we've kind of seen previewed a bit like a good bit where you get to see jill's uh new kind of tricks that she can do that leon and claire couldn't do in uh resident evil 2 remake so jill has a a quick dodge which is just mwah, perfect so love good. it you really need that to get get away from zombies this time because Oh boy, there's a lot coming at you. So if you don't have that dodge, you would be in a lot of trouble. Uh, with that dodge, you can get a perfect dodge where if you time it just in the right way, it'll have a little bit of slow-mo where you can use your gun to get a slow-mo headshot, which is always nice. Um, this game looks great. It kind of looks amazing. It's, 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 it's a small little map that you're given to explore in this demo of Raccoon City. So a lot of places are kind of closed off, but the lighting is fantastic. This is set before and after the events of Resident Evil 2. So this is before it's a full like outbreak. So people are still running around, there's survivors everywhere. It's just, you're full on panic mode and things are still working like there's still electricity there's neon lights in shops everywhere the, no, the shops haven't been fully like looted or destroyed like there's there's stuff around and there's people around and they're doing a really great job at communicating that just through the set dressing and the lighting it really feels like a world like you go you start off in a subway and there's just posters for stuff everywhere there's a little kiosk it just feels like people have just suddenly got up and are leaving um how how what you make of it brian uh i was really really impressed um i i i started up the first time and rebecca was watching me play it and she was like wow like because just just because they've really really pushed the ori engine from from last year to what it is now it just looks it looks insane yeah, like as good as it looks very good. As good as the lighting and everything was in Resident Evil Two Remake, they really have fine tuned it. Yeah, and so like I'm I'm going up out of the subway and I'm stopping every like step just to look at all the like set design and all the posters. They're so fucking funny. It's set in ninety eight, so there's some like real good fake alien and fake Top Gun posters and stuff. It's, yeah, some good it's stuff. Pretty good fake it fake it poster in yeah. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So John, you played it, I presume. I did. And you were you were the not Resident Evil Two remake fan. So how did how did you feel about it? Uh, like it, I thought it was really impressive. Um, I thought it like yeah, like it looked amazing. Um, I felt way more excited to explore the like cityscape than I felt with the police station Resident Evil Two. Um, I just thought it was like a much more engaging location, and I think it really lets them like flex their like interior design muscles with like all the different stores and like all the different like signage for the stores and everything um yeah it was it was it was good like it seemed like something the kind of the people who like resident evil remake 2 are gonna like this like it's it's a good extension of that and um, the quick dodge stuff was was really cool um I liked Jill a lot in it. I, I thought she seemed really, really cool. Um, I was not a fan of Claire in the previous one, but Jill seemed kind of awesome in this, and I was really happy about that because part of me was worried that it was just going to be, like, the same character again. Because, you know, like, Resident Evil in the past have not traditionally been super good. There's, like, there's Albert Wesker, there's male hero, and there's female hero, you know? And I think... I know... I'm sorry, Neve, I'm sorry, but <laughs> that's kind of the case. Um <laughs> Yeah, I'm in your head canon. I'm sure it's not, but um, it's your full screen, Eve, and I can see every tiny, like, angry expression. How um, dare but you? But yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Um, like in terms of just like how interested am I am in this game? It's like this demo was a really nice opportunity for me to be like, cool, not for me, but I'm sure everyone's gonna have a real good time. Yeah, with we this. will. Yeah, like. It's, you know, this is an action game at this point. Like, this is straight up action game. And it's a good one. And I think people, you know, it, it's building on everything cool that the remake 2 did. Um, 
not the direction I'd like to see the series go, but that's just me. Uh, um, I really like Jill as well, because the last game I played was Revelations, where my criticism of Jill in that was that she had no personality. She's just capable. She's just like, I'm very good at doing everything. But like in this, she's kind of got, like you don't get to hear much dialogue in this little demo, but she seems, she seems confident. She seems cool. She seems a little like sassy. Like I like what they're doing. She tells I'm, Carlos to go. F she tells Carlos to fuck off or something, doesn't she? Yeah. Does. Like I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get to know this Jill, um, this Jill because I think Jill outside of maybe like uh, Resident Evil Three Nemesis has kind of and and one uh, and remake uh, original remake kind of has been done dirty and kind of everything else she's been in. So I, I'm happy that Jill is getting this character moment as well she's really cool this feels like a lady who's in special forces yeah yeah she knows she knows what she's doing yeah and um, what do you guys think of nemesis very scary he's a spooky boy he's so tall yeah and like yeah like to me it's like the alien isolation game or something where like his whole like vanishing and then reappearing somewhere else was fucking crazy and yeah, it's so he, like, aggressive zips and off fast. Into the air. Yeah. It's wild. He's super aggressive I, and his reach is really far with his tentacle. Like even if you quick dodge away from him, he can slap you back really quickly. So for me, I only had that one section right at the end of the game where he attacks you before basically the demo ends. Did he appear in other places for you guys? Yeah. No, once you or... pick up the hose, uh, you trigger him. So if you want to go around and explore more, he'll be following you. But if you just run with the hose all the way up to the top, oh. you can you can just end it there. But there is other stuff you can do. Like there's a, the bobbleheads in it. If you get 20 of those, so one of them to get another bobblehead, you have to down Nemesis three times. So... I just kind of experimented with shooting Nemesis a lot, and he's got loads of those cool animation bits that made Resident Evil 2 remake so special, especially with Mr. X. So if you shoot his little mechanical heart that he has on his chest, he'll start putting his hand over it so you can't get crits on him anymore. And that was really cool. And you can, there's just a lot of more um, environmental stuff to kind of damage him. There's the electricity box that you can shoot that will stun him and stun zombies around him and you can get downs on him so you, you won't be able to kill him but you can get him down and he's two types of downs which will give you different type different time limit limits to get away from him so i, I had fun playing um, around with him but yeah with the that first demo time you can he like end it. the first time he like hunched over and like charged like my stomach dropped i was like oh shit because like the big guys in Resident Evil, like Mr. X and him, I don't think they've ever done that before. And that was really scary. Like, he really wants to rugby tackle you. Yeah. And he's a big yeah. boy. But, um, and you, you, you enjoyed it? Yeah, no, I did. Um, my only worry with Nemesis is that like, he'll get annoying. Um, or like, you'll really, really want to get from A to B and it, it he'll become frustrating so I hope that there's enough variety with him that it doesn't feel like it's a copy paste the entire time you see him or that he has enough kind of detail did you find that with did you find that with Mr. X um not really but then like with with Mr. X I kind of believed him for a tiny bit and then as soon as the thing happened where like he can't go into your safe room I kind of stopped believing him as like um as, as, as like a proper enemy or like or you know just as some video game character or as some sort of program but i guess with miss yeah but i yeah. guess with nemesis like they're really really pushing the whole thing that like he's there to fuck up your progress yeah. well like even even i like i played through the demo once um and even i felt like just the way he moves and the things he could do felt a lot more fleshed out than mr x like he really felt he felt present in that environment in a way that mr x never really did yeah to like me. And I thought like, like really to me, cool. it felt like it was someone else playing as him online, like just ruining your game. Hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's a good way of thinking about it. Because it didn't feel like it was programmed. Yeah. yeah. 
like with Brian, with you're kind of worried that it would get annoying. I think they've uh, put in some stuff to make that to mitigate that. If you get a grenade, a grenade is an instant down for him, and it's a really long down. I think it's nearly a full minute where okay. you can get away from him. That's so, correct. like, if you have a grenade, like that's and and a red barrel, they will just totally take him down. Yeah, and like I I I I, I know it uh, with with that team, they're very good at like adapting the difficulty based on your resources. Things like that, and how like you could you could kill a zombie, but they might come back up again if you walk over them, stuff like that. I felt like these zombies were respawning a lot. Yeah, they, they were, were really getting up. Um, I really like the zombie designs. It seems like there's a lot more variety with them. Um, they really look like civilians that are just that have been turned. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for this game. It's coming out in just under two weeks, third yeah. of April. And Whoa, God, I didn't know we were so close. Yeah. yeah, and I'm really excited to check out Resident Evil Resistance as well, where you will get to play as a Mr. X type character. And uh, that's exciting. Yeah, no, that should be fun. Interesting times for Resident Evil. Um, Brian. Yes. Tell us about Umihara Kawase Fresh. Okay, Umihara Kawase is a puzzle platformer series that uh, really only exists in Japan, but in more recent years they've started localizing it uh, in the West. This is the Switch uh, iteration of the franchise, and it's pretty cute. Um, I've always wanted to play these games because I always see the main character, uh, Uehara, in like novelty fighting games. She's in Blade Strangers and a few other bits and pieces like that. And I like platformers where you have a bad jump, but instead you have a cool item that allows you to get up and down and left and right, things like that. And so this is kind of like a puzzle platformer. Um, and you just play as a girl with a fishing rod and you are in a town with animals in it and it has a lot of verticality and you are scaling the town, trying to find ingredients for the different villagers to make food. And it's all it sounds super cute. It's super cute, and you it's sound all like gone. Yeah. Um. And it's oh man, yeah. It, 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 honestly, yeah. Um. And it's all mission based, and it has really, really, really nice visuals. It's kind of got this like low poly three D design to it, but then all the cutscenes have this like really nice flat, simple vector art, and so like the like like in terms of presentation, it's great. Um, in terms of gameplay, it's okay. The way her fishing hook works is it's kind of physics based. So what you do is you really have to like grab and latch onto something and then like swing her left or right with the analog stick and kind of like, I don't know, like kind of quap her way across platforms. Mm. Like, you know, you know, that game Grow Home where like you kind of have to like throw the character forward r rather than like walk them forward. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. so I guess it's kind of adaptive that way. Um, so it definitely takes a while to get used to the controls, and the game keeps throwing up like tutorials and like stuff you've already figured out, or like multiple different ways of doing the same thing with different button combinations. It seems like it has like too many buttons, and the controls could have been way more simpler, or like they could have given you like one or two ways, and then you could have customized it after the fact in the options. But it seems like it gives you a, all of that. On the, at, at, at the start, so it feels more cumbersome and complicated than it needs to be. Um, and the music isn't very good. I think it only has one song the entire game. Oh so it's no! One of the, so it's one of those things where like it plays the music from the main menu, and then you launch the level, and it's the same song. And every time you play the level, it has the same song. And like it'd be cool if there was like a day and night cycle or something, you know, where it would play like a different version of the song, just something, because like. Other departments seem to kind of like really polish their end, and other and then other parts seem unfinished. Um, but like, it's fine. I I I got it for twenty quid. That's the most I pay for it. Um, I know you're not into a game, Brian. Whenever you bring up its price, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really 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 curious about the original game. I think it's I, I think it only came out in the Super Famicom, but um, it's just one of those weird. Like, it, it looks really, really 90s if you look at any of the visuals. Like, there's lots of... Wait, this was a, this was a Super Famicom game? Like, this series? Yes. And 
I never knew that. That's and insane. She's always kind of had more or less the same design. They've kind of like chibied her up in the more recent iterations, but she did look like more like a traditional anime girl before with short hair and the black hoodie uh, and the pink sneakers. Right. Um, but like there, there's always been these enemies where it's like a carp with like human legs just like patrolling left and right. Yeah. And like it kind of looks like a bit like Seaman, you know, that Dreamcast game. Like it's got that weird 90s kind of like unfinished like texture aesthetic to it yeah, um, yeah. which is kind of neat in 2020 <laughs> I look forward to playing as her in Blade Strangers yeah, oh, she, whenever that game goes on Blade sale Blade Strangers is fantastic I want to play it when it goes on sale too I played in the arcades in Japan and I loved it yeah seems cool um, guys I played Darksiders 3 whoa this is uh, THQ's um, yeah. game, isn't it? I yeah, I think so. THQ Nordic, maybe. <laughs> um, I'm con- the 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 lineage of Darksiders is is confusing. Um, but this is one of those games. I read a lot about it, um, and I kind of just became interested, like with the general response, because the initial response was very muted. And then I felt like you had a backlash of people saying, no, this game's actually really good. And I wanted to see what the deal was. I've never played a Darksiders game. I understand that they're kind of like Legend of Zelda with metal. Okay. And yeah, I'm kind of, I think I'm kind of done with them, um, with kind of Ocarina of Time likes, you know, I've kind of, you know, I love, love, love the games we've played, but kind of, I've done that and I'm cool. But I've heard that this game went more of a Dark Souls slash character action kind of direction. And so it starts off and you're playing as Fury. And Fury is like the third horseman of the apocalypse. The first one being War from Darksiders 1. Second one being Death from Darksiders 2. And the fourth one being Strife, I think. And he's like got his own spin-off game he seems like a like he strife seems like deadpool <laughs> but um yeah <laughs> like he really there's no other way to cut it than that but um you're playing as fury in this one and i know i haven't played that much of it i've played maybe two or three hours and this really feels like a game that was in development and then dark souls someone played Dark Souls and they were like, oh, we need to make a fucking Dark Souls game right now. And it's strange because like, it has the structure of Dark Souls, but not really like the the difficulty or challenge. The combat so far has been very, very simple. There's like one attack button and you can vary up your combos by like, not even by hitting like heavy, there's no heavy button yet or there's no like, there, there's like the main action and then a secondary attack but the main way you vary up your combos is by like hitting like square square pause for a second and then square that's how you do a slightly better combo than just your average hit but your weapon is like this these like whips and one problem I'm kind of having right now is that like I think you know if you're going to do like a souls like game the, the balancing the difficulty is very important and I think it needs to feel I think your actions need to feel intentional and you need to feel very like like if you're facing a crowd of enemies that needs to be like kind of a big deal but in this your attacks hit so wide that if you're fighting four enemies if you make an attack you're going to hit all of them and the second attack's going to hit all of them and then you're going to juggle all of them so it's this weird mashup between like kind of more hack and slashy games and a souls like and i'm not sure it particularly works um the combat never really feels very satisfying like whenever you see an enemy there's much more a feeling of like time to clean up this mess as opposed to time to defeat this enemy do you know what i mean yeah Uh, um but that said there is stuff i am kind of enjoying about it like um the whole premise of the game is that the fucking old gods or whatever they are i don't know they call fury and they're like oh shit's getting really bad and we need you to go kill the seven deadly sins and so each of the bosses seven deadly sin and that's like yep cool you know kind of like you've everyone's played a game like that i'm sure but they pair you up with this like assistant kind of like a navi from ocarina of time but she's a watcher and she's this like weird nearly kind of 
I'm gonna say gimp, but imagine like a really cool gimp. <laughs> okay. What do you mean a gimp? Like a sex gimp? As in like, I can't tell if she's like in a leather costume or she's just, that's just what she looks like. Okay. Oh. So she's in a cat suit? Not really. <laughs> um... Cause she, um, imagine like a gimp dressed up as a wizard. Is she a girl? Does, gimp. does she look like she's in a dominating? Does she like? What's happened? If you went down to the, if you went down to like the local S and M club and it was Dungeons and Dragons night, this woman wouldn't look out of place. Oh, I'm looking at a picture of her. Okay, I kind of okay. Am I doing this design design a disservice? No, you're yeah. The, I'm seeing the gimp thing. She does have a chain on her, and she does have a kind of fully black. Like it looks like she could be wearing latex, or it looks like her body is just completely alien, and she has a like, just kind of. She looks like a yeah. She's part. She's part weird ethereal creature. Yeah, she doesn't look human, but is human shaped. <laughs> yeah. But she's actually a lot of fun because it turns out, like, not long after, like, you meet her, she's actually, like, a massive fangirl of Fury, who you're playing as. And she's like, I, you're, you're Fury? Like, you're the horsewoman, kind of. And Fury's like, yeah, like, okay, whatever. But then, like, you can eat, and it's all through these, like, little dialogue exchanges. You can feel them kind of warming towards each other. Like, t towards the end of my last session, Fury was kind of like, um, um, she said something, and it was like, like, I'm beginning not to tire of your voice, or something like that. Like, it are was they so, a like, ship, John? Are they a ship? Are you shipping? Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm not shipping because, as established, don't really ship very often. But like, there, it seems like there's, oh, there is like an affection between them, and I'm enjoying that a lot. And like, there's this, it. It, it, you know, feels a little bit like some sub-dom stuff going on, and I'm finding that element of the game kind of endearing to the point where I'm like, I'm not having a lot of fun playing this, but I'm at least kind of interested to see where all this goes. All right. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, not bad, because yeah. this was free on PSN as well, wasn't it? Yeah, and like, if what I've said sounds like it appeals to you and you had downloaded this on PSN, yeah, like, boo it up, like, give it a go. Um... Combat's not great. Um, now maybe maybe I'll like pick up new tools and like it'll get more interesting, but it also just doesn't feel great. You know what I mean? Like I think you know if an action game is going to be good, you doing your most basic attack to an enemy needs to feel good. You know the sword swings from DMC Five they feel fucking amazing. The attacks from Bayonetta, shooting a gun in Vanquish, it all feels amazing. The basic ass strike in this feels okay and so its appeal as an action game is going to be really limited because of that but yeah fuck it like this this feels like this feels like xbox 360 games used to feel <laughs> and maybe that's a massive downside for you or maybe it's it's good but like i am at least intrigued enough that i'm going to play more yes brian will you be playing more of chibi robo Ziplash. Uh, yeah, I probably will. Um, this is a 3DS game starring Chibi Robo, and this is also another platformer where you don't jump and you have a tethered line instead to allow you to hire places. Uh, and I much prefer this game um, to the other one. Uh, I bought this game because uh, it was very, very cheap, and I wanted the Chibi Robo amiibo, and it was cheaper to buy the amiibo bundled with the game than it was to buy the amiibo on its own. Okay, okay, <laughs> Brian, going back, is is this is this a Japanese game? Is, did they localize this one? The, like, has is this Chibi Robo in the West? Yeah. Okay. So Chibi Robo has always been in the West because someone in Nintendo tried so hard to get people to like Chibi Robo, and only about God and only him. about five people, including myself, liked it. And it took me like 15 years to like it. <laughs> and uh, I love the original Chibi Robo for the GameCube. And there's a, a DS game as well called Park Patrol, Park Patrol. But then this isn't a like house sim cleaning management game. This is just like a very mediocre platformer starring the same character. And it's a very easy game to play. But if you want a 100% a level, that's very tricky because you'd have to like make sure you're standing in the right spot and timing your whip to kind of like 
to like get the right bits and pieces. Uh, it's a very simple game to play. It kind of feels like a mobile game, to be honest. Okay. Does it have that same like weird energy the Tribi Robo? That's has? the thing. It does, and the music and sound design is exactly the same as the GameCube game, and it has that same charm and dialogue. And so, even though it's a completely different game in terms of gameplay, it still feels like it belongs in the Chippy Robo game, and it has. Because, because I feel like I would wade through some very average gameplay for that Chibi Robo magic. Yep, that's what I'm doing right now because this is this is it. This is all you're getting. <laughs> like, this is the last thing Chibi Robo will ever be in. Like, I don't see him making like making a comeback for the Switch. And I just wanted that amiibo because I'm still thinking about that GameCube game, and I want to own all that weird Chibi Robo bullshit. Like, I bought a strategy guide in Japanese for the GameCube game. I love it. I love it when you love a game enough that you're like, I'm going to buy the strategy guide, which is an insane thing to do in 2020. But you just need it because you just need to own it. I like the artwork. I just wanted to see all the models together and it has all their like stats. Yeah. It, it was just, it was a good time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I, I don't know why I'm playing a 3DS game, but you know, here we are. Here we are. So guys, I talked a lot of shit about the new Pokemon. You did. You sure did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I got Michelle a little Switch, and I got her Pokemon. And since then, I've been watching her play it. And at some point, I just I just kind of got the itch, and I was like, "Fuck it! I think I, I think I need to invest in this thing." And I have been playing Pokemon Sword. It has been my quarantine game. And it's really good. <laughs> I really like it. They got you. Like, they they totally got me. And like, I still think like the way that game was presented pre-release, not great. Um, but and like a, a lot of the things I like, the things that I was worried about it are still there. Like, it's still this is a Pokemon game. This is that same game you've played before. There is no difference really and like any kind of like big step forward i was hoping pokemon was gonna take it's never gonna happen like it's just it's and why would it like these games sell like fucking hotcakes every time they have no they have no reason to like really innovate or really do something like new and i was you know i'm i, I was and still kind of am hung up on that because i'd like them to just nuke all the pokemon that exist just just get rid of every one of them. Let's start again. Let's make 60 Pokemon. Let's make them the best fucking most interesting weird Pokemon ever. Let's give them all these super strange battle mechanics. Let's just go insane. Let's make some mistakes. Well, I mean, they They're kind of tried they kind of tried to leave out the old Pokemon and you were on you were one of the people who was like, "Dex it. They should put them all in." I fucking was not. You totally no were. Way. I, uh, Neve, you can go back and listen to those episodes and listen to me be like, I don't give a shit about Dexit. I don't care at all. Okay. Well, that was one of the big complaints, but like... And that was. And like, I thought that was silly because to me, like, my problem with Pokemon is stagnation, not, oh no, I can't have a Gengar in my team for the eighth time. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, look... <sighs> When I actually like when I actually like saw the game in motion and like I saw Michelle play it, it was like, wow, there is a lot of effort that like has gone into this, and like it's a lot of it's po- like it's all polished. The menus, the menu and like, systems are amazing for us. Yeah, and like just the way they like repositioned the camera and like some of the stuff, like they have changed up the way that wild encounters work. Like now, Pokemon are like. 3D models that walk around and that is actually really cool because they've done this other really interesting thing where even in early early level areas you can totally run into like a level 50 Pokemon that will just wipe your entire team if you try and fight it and I like that a lot because in previous games the like the areas are always scaled to your level or at least what level they think you're going to be at when you hit there and it kind of takes away from the idea that like these are wild animals that might attack you and I really like that they kind of broke away from that and um honestly i've just been having a terrific time with it like it's it's got me the way pokemon gets me and i really really didn't think that was gonna happen um i still think like you still have to go wade through about two hours of bullshit right at the start of the game before things get interesting 
Um, and like every 30 minutes, some fucking adult is like, oh, it's you, the trainer. And they talk to you for five minutes about fucking nothing. <laughs> and that's an aspect of the series that's gotten worse over time. And I don't like it because like in the first Pokemon game, Prof Professor Oak was like, fucking good luck. Get it, you know, get out there, do your thing. And then that was you. But in a lot of the new games, it's a lot of like adult characters being like, wow, you solved the puzzle of my gym. You're so amazing. And I don't like that. I just like the idea that you're a kid <laughs> with your weird monster friends and you're out on an adventure. But um, a lot of the new Pokemon are great. Uh, the Pokemon selection in general, I feel like is really fantastic. And like every new area is just like brimming with new creatures. And it's like, it's, it's exciting and it's fun. And I've... Yeah, like I was, I was definitely wrong about this game, um, and it feels good to be wrong in this case because it's like it's just a really polished adventure, and it's just so easy to play, and I, it is the perfect quarantine game. And with that, let's say we move into some quick time events. Guys, E3 is cancelled. Oh no. Uh, yeah, it fucked up, said some shit it shouldn't have said. <laughs> oh, uh, that got cancelled. Yeah. Lego Super Mario is an... No! Yeah, so... <laughs> Why did that? So this is because of the coronavirus uh, concerns, but it kind of feels like a little bit of a... I don't know, like it nearly wasn't going to go ahead. It felt like it was on its... Deathbed, anyway. It's definitely got more underwhelming re in recent years. I, I think it definitely would have gone ahead, like for sure. Yeah. Next year, oh, I don't know, but this, yeah, it's like despite everything, it's insane to me that it's cancelled. Like I can hardly believe it, even though like it should be. But like two weeks ago, even I don't think we could have. I couldn't have really imagine that it would have. You know. Yeah. Hmm. It's just like Are you guys Sony. Sad about it? Yeah, I yeah, like it sucks. I, the thing I love about E3 is like it's like it, you know with gamer Christmas is what they say, but it's like everyone's on Twitter, everyone's excited, everyone's talking about games and like it's I I like that energy and I love new game announcements and I love all this news and it's fun to kind of be in that moment with everyone and I think that's what mm. kind of sad as someone who, you know, being in Ireland I've never been to an E3 but like that aspect to me is sad that we won't have that and I'm sure we'll have kind of individual events but it's that kind of you know that that week of games thing that is really exciting and fun yeah and it sucks because like we were talking about like live stream and some of the some of the announcements and stuff and that would have been fun yeah I really like yeah. uh, show floors demos and stuff like that like I always like when a game company does like a cool set or there's a game everybody's excited about and there's a massive queue for it and there's always that footage of the big massive queue I, I like that kind of stuff yeah but yeah it, it's just going to be all streamed keynotes at this point if, if they are going to do something in June but it won't with like it won't be called E3 it'll just be called like you know soul company special events kind of things yeah it's it's such a weird feeling do you think there's an E3 2021? I think E3 would do a good job of rebranding completely. Like maybe leave them, leave it for a year or two, yeah. and just like maybe even change the name. I don't know because I think that and this event is needed. Like I think, you know, it's very easy for Sony and EA to do a live stream and tell us this news, but for smaller publishers and smaller people, it's it's harder to get that message out. Maybe. So I think there's always going to be a need for it. And, you know, people want to go to these things as well. But I don't know, E3 itself, maybe just with even all the punditry about like, does it matter and all that questions. I think there's been, I don't know, there's just kind of been a shadow thrown over it that makes me think that maybe some people just want to pull away from E3 itself and not you know, just a cool video game con for both professionals and fans. Yeah, yeah. It's it's such a weird thing. Because it's, it's not the first time E3 didn't happen. I think. 
Wasn't there a year where he, no, maybe he, that was when it was at a different location? He, it, it used to be called Space World, didn't it? God, maybe I'm getting this wrong. Rebrand, go back to Space World. Space World yeah, is yeah. such a good name. Mm-hmm. That could be anything. But yeah, it's interesting times. And like, you know, it, like the, there is like the argument that it's this is speeding up the inevitable because there's a lot of people who think that E3 doesn't really have a future in streaming that like people just game developers aren't going to pay millions of dollars for like a booth or like a you know big stage show or anything like that and i get that well like but before before it was cancelled there was a lot of pullouts from like um the big game companies this this is like a month or two ago and that it was going to be focused on uh kind of like uh streamers and influencers and you know, people like like people that consumers would watch that aren't in the game industry, but that are hype people. I guess. Mm. Yeah. You're you're ninjas of yeah, the world. The flossers. <laughs> yeah. And now it's now how now who's gonna lead us to to do a massive choreographed floss? Not me. Neve, I asked you a question. Uh, not me. Uh, okay. Would a super eye patch will step up and do a little bit of flossing? Yeah, pro gamer. I, you know, I've always, I, I'm always thinking about how to leverage the brand. You know, you know, I'm always saying that to you guys. Yeah. And I've been thinking for a while if I can get into Fortnite, but not like playing the game, but just like the culture around Fortnite. Yeah, just be a phony like, Fortnite um, dude. Launch yeah, one like, of your videos a, in Fortnite. Like they can that's tell it, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. They can tell half and, like, the Star um, Wars story in it, so you may as well just... Mm. Next YouTube video is 100% Fortnite exclusive. And it's about the dark underbelly of a cult. John, how about John? Yeah. How about your next video is called Fortnite Unboxing, and there is neither Fortnite nor unboxing in it. Like, that sounds so good. And like what I could do is I could just I could do a Fortnite stream, but the stream is me pulling up pulling up the patch notes for Fortnite and being like, what is this bullshit? Let, let me if if this is the changes they're gonna make, I'm not even I'm just not even touching it for the foreseeable future and I just keep this going and going and going and I never play Fortnite. <laughs> and then I floss. That'd be great. Um have Perfect. you guys ever dabbed? I I I I, I I think we had this conversation before, and Neve, Neve, Neve's very good at dabbing. I've not dabbed once, excuse you. I've seen... Neve, there's literal photo evidence of you dabbing with two yeah. cartons of milk, and it was taken in 2019. That was the milk salute. Oh, not a dab. The no. Mi- the milk salute. All milk girls do it to each other. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. I'm uh, I'm not sure I do. I, um, I'm really, really worried about dabbing. I guess we need to, we need to come up we need to come up with a milk. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really, really worried about dabbing because I'm worried I'm gonna like hit something like a book off my shelf and it'll go flying. Cause like I feel like I'm yeah. Cause, cause that will definitely happen. You need to keep a safe mm-hmm. safe distance from everything. Cause, cause you know how when you like do one of those like flosses or dabs, you're like moving your hands, but you're not looking at where your hands are. And you're supposed to like trust them. No, it's an inherent part of the yeah. Dab. And like, I, I, I would not trust my hands if I did not see them at all times. Someone holds a gun to your head and they're like, "You have to flush a dab." Which you do? Dab. Flossing is hard. Dabbing is really easy. I'd probably try and dab and hope that I survive. But like, <laughs> may, may, maybe I'll dab and hit the gunman, and I'll get out of there. Yeah. I got. I've got bad news, guys. The gunman was ninja, and he's like, "Wrong move, motherfuckers!" Blam. Well, maybe this will finally get him cancelled. <laughs> oh, that oh, guy's so lame. Life. We can get him to yeah, do the milk sucks. salute and tell him, and then tell him it was a white power thing. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck's sake. The milk salute is not a white power No, the uh, mil- milk is for everyone. Neve, you, you invented so you you invent, invented something so pure and now it's ruined. <laughs> oh, but I was just thinking about it. The only like if if I heard the word milk salute, I was just like, I bet that's racist somehow. <laughs> to me it's religious. 
it's like oh, we only drink milk in this house cause the lord <laughs> Jesus notorious milk yeah. goes there they're like so you've no wine no there is no wine in the bible only milk it's like I don't know I think there was no there's only milk in the bible <laughs> now we're getting into it oh I love I love this character milk priest <laughs> It's the body of Christ. <laughs> Drink it up. The Milky Ways are on me. are his bones. <laughs> oh, so yeah, E3 is cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> but milk, there's milk a plenty full for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mil- milk salute. <laughs> ne- what's the milk salute look like? It is just a dab. You just have to be holding two cartons of milk while doing it. <laughs> yeah, and not little cartons like big like two liter that's yeah big boys yeah yeah do we have that photo we should tweet out that photo no (laughs) 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 oh lego super mario is announced and let i i don't know about this guy as a lego connoisseur and a mario hater mario has done it again he's ruined something i loved I think this looks shit. This looks bad. Where's just give us a Mario minifig? I, I, what is this horrible abomination? I'd really, I hate I'd really rather rather a Mushroom Kingdom diorama with like yeah. the lads. This is exactly this or is Bowser's the, castle. Yeah, like like this is them going for like oh, it's supposed to be a level base, but like you're meant to have like some sort of honor system where you're meant to like play it properly, but like nobody's gonna play this game properly. Um. It's like the people who buy Lego mostly. There's two. There's two pe- people who Legos for, and it's children and adults. And the people buying Mario Lego it's, specifically. It's just children, Neve. It's just Neve. It's just children. <laughs> no, it's adults as well. <laughs> uh, but no one plays with their Lego. People want to build it and put it on a shelf. Even most kids don't like playing with their Lego. They just want to, unless you're a small kid and it's a big bucket of Lego. But big weird anal kids aka adults like to build the lego and then put it on a big shelf. big weird anal kids yep. that's what an adult is it's not wrong so, so i hate that this is like a little game like no one's gonna play that um i i how is it like how is it a game what does like i'm not sure you're, you're, so so you're meant to set the timer for a minute and you're meant to collect coins because in the because in the youtube video they sort of explain it, and and he has like a different like color reader on his feet to tell you like whether you're jumping on a jumping under a brick or above a brick, or if you're jumping on an enemy. So it has this weird big blocky figure of Mario that has a little screen built into his chest. He has a screen in his chest and, and his you. mouth and eyes. Yeah, and he looks nightmarish. Um, I his eyes change. Yeah. And, and and his mouth changes from like a smiling grin to like an open mouth under his mustache. Um, I don't. I I okay. So for me, I kind of want to own this when it gets like real cheap, and nobody wants it, and I just want to own it and have it on my shelf. Just just the Mario as a weird yeah as Mario as thing. a weird Mario thing. Um, I'll see. It's probably going to be really expensive as well at launch. Mm-hmm. This is yeah. Nintendo. Like they can charge whatever they want, and they will. And Lego. And I feel Lego. like, I feel like this is this is nightmarish in a way I appreciate. Once I saw his expression change, I was like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it it's something. Um, I I will be one of the I, I I will be one of the adults who owns this. I don't know if I want the full set or anything, but uh, I I just want it for my shelf. But it it it, it looks weird. But then, I hope if anything, this this is going to be the start of some better Mario sets because there is some really nice things they could make uh, for people to collect. But they, they're working with Nintendo now, so let's hope they do more than just this. Yeah, it'd be cool. To like to see like a Bowser airship, something like that. Yeah, like because like to me in the like trailer they show for it, like because it's just like you're building like beams, you're building just lines. And it's supposed to represent a 2D yeah. plane. And so, like, you're meant to fill in the blanks yourself with the skyline and the horizon and everything. But, like, it really just looked like you were walking across planks to get from A to B to C. And 
it didn't really feel believable or imaginative like Lego normally does. It felt a bit empty. It feels pretty like far off for Lego. Like if you showed me this without packaging, I wouldn't immediately think yeah. Lego. Yeah. I think that's a problem, to be honest. I think it's kind of yeah. cool, but also mostly a problem. Um, crunch time on Last of Us Two. Sucks. Um, this, 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 yeah, this is a thing that I happens mean, in Naughty Dog, isn't it? Like they have this weird, like, strive for perfection, and it's kind of pushed into the mantra of the staff. Big time. Um, it was like I think I think Naughty Dog kind of came under fire for this when they did the art. Well, not when they did when um, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels came out. That um, Jason yeah. Schreier book. And there was that infamous line where the guy is like, "Sure, we have to we have to stay late at night, but then when a player shoots that bag, and the rice grains pour out, and the bag deflates as if it were an actual bag, you know, we know it was all worth it, or something like that." Yeah, they're and like, that "That's worth a weekend, most... or something," and you're just yeah, like, Whoa. and it's like, "What?" <laughs> like, oh. But um, this, it kind of went into like some of like Naughty Dog's hiring practices. And it's the kind of thing where they're like, well, we want to hire people who are going to want to work late. And it's like, yeah, everyone wants to work late in an interview. Like, and there's, but there's only so long that can last before it starts taking away from persons, you know, their family time, their personal time, but like their health as well. And like, it sucks because we've been over this kind of story so many times. It nearly gets to the point where you don't even know what to say because it's all the fucking same. Like, mm-hmm. it's Rockstar, it's CD Projekt Red, it's Naughty Dog, but it's it's weird how recently this kind of stuff has been fine for developers, and it's only now that it's like, but it's not even like they're, it's not even like they seem to be, like, doing better practices and standards, it's just they're talking about it less, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they know that public um, opinion is against them, so they're not putting it out anymore as like, oh, you know, we did, like, as a kind of nearly a badge of honor, like they used to. Yeah, yeah, totally. You used to have, like, publishers bragging about how much crunch there'd be. I remember... No, I always remember, like... Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I remember way back in the day when I used to buy gaming magazines, they had this one article by... Um, a like game developer and it was the first thing I'd ever read from someone who actually made games and I remember it was this was like 20 years ago and it was him just being like okay you want you want to you want to make games this is what it's like and it was just this like not even 200 word article but just him being like you stay after midnight to work on a game you hate that you know is going to review poorly and that's this industry and it's like this isn't a new thing with AAA games, this thing has been a part of the industry for fucking ever, but it does just feel like especially gross, and like we've experienced this in our own field where it's like, you can't help feel like people's passion is kind of just funneled into these projects and exploited to the point that it's like, and then like a lot of them get ends up getting treated really shitty, you know, mm-hmm. like remember the whole Rockstar taking people off the credits thing, and this just feels like an extension of that, and it's like, cool, and like, this gets into personal preference, but like, With Naughty Dog, I just don't feel like anything they do with games is really that interesting. Like, I feel like they make triple A movies that are games, but I think, like, the things they do with the medium, generally, I don't... I just don't think it's worth this, you know? I don't think any game's worth it. I would rather wait, like, six years for a game that I knew everyone on it had a healthy work-life balance than get a game in three to four years, because we're waiting long times anyway, and know that people crunched and missed out on family time and missed out on their, like, like, damaged their mental health and their physical health. Working like, like that will damage both of those things very quickly. Like, I, I would rather wait, personally, as a gamer who loves games. Yeah, totally. But, like, my point would be that, like, I feel like there is this tendency to kind of fetishize the kind of results that come from this kind of stuff. And to me, it's just not that impressive. Like, it's just, it seems like a shitty trade, yeah. you know? Yeah, like the Rockstar horse balls. Like, it's, okay, it is very <laughs> interesting that they shrink in cold weather, but I... Oof, who needs that? <laughs> Not I. Someone yeah. needed that. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
I I remember that the series The Legend of Korra, I think it was during season two production, they put out a promo video of all the staff working hard on it and they had like animators like uh like with like sprains in their wrists and they were like rubbing their arms and stuff from all the drawing and there was like footage of a guy sleeping underneath his desk. But it was all played up as like this is this is this is what they do to make Korra for you and stuff and it was supposed to be promoted as, <sighs> as this like like look how like as if they're fighting a war or something and ever and like it got such negative backlash that it was just footage of staff being exploited um that stuff is so insidious as well yeah. because then you'll have like people like you know there'll be articles about crunch and how bad it is and then you'll have little idiots who's never worked in a studio in any capacity in any creative industry being like Oh, well, you know, it's passion, you know, they want to work like this and they want to do it this way. And there will always be a minority of people who absolutely do want to work and do crunch like this. But that is the minority in a studio, not like the majority ever. But you get people kind of being like, it's passion. This is games like they're getting to do their dream job. This is, you know, what it takes. And they should have to sleep under their desk, you know, because they're driven so much by this. But like for a lot of people, it's their dream jobs. For a lot of people, it is their dream job and just their job, you know? They wanna go home, they wanna see their family, they wanna do their hobbies, they're just people. And then for other more people, it is just a job that they aren't even that passionate about. It's just what pays the bills. Yeah, it, it, you know? they, they are hired for their skills, not for their creativity. It, it's yep. just, it's yeah, it's work. Um, I, I, I think if you're the creative lead at the very top, work whatever, what, work whatever hours you want, because sure, it was probably your baby to begin with. Yeah, and you're also you're also gonna reap the full rewards yeah, from it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Contract workers on a paycheck aren't gonna get residuals in most cases. No, they're getting paid once. But you know, we we we've we've all worked places as well where like I've worked alongside people who are like they were so passionate about the company we worked for and they were willing to do anything like you know unpaid overtime was just not even a question like of course you did it and if you weren't doing it what were you doing like and then i've seen those same companies turn around on them five years later and after all this work them just be rewarded with a layoff yeah you know Mm -hmm. and i think that's still what the games industry is like and i i feel like sometimes like enough people don't realize that and they think like there's always a carrot at the end of this stuff and sometimes there just isn't and i think it's a real bummer to see that exploited in people but yeah again kind of hard to know what to say because it just keeps happening like ultimately unionization i think is kind of the only thing that will stop this it's not going to be the good of these giant companies hearts but yeah hope things get better guys a nintendo indie direct yeah it did um, I thought there was some. Yeah, cool there stuff was. In this. Um, I like that game made by the No Man's Sky team. It seems like a much smaller game in terms of scope. Looks. What'd you like about that? Um, I really like the visuals of No Man's Sky, but I have no interest in ever playing that game. And I've wanted to play something that is in a genre that I would be more interested in. So this seems like that. Just a little third person. Yeah. Did you did you check this out at all, Neve? No. You guys are gonna have to fill me in. I can't remember the name of it. We'll do. It. Um, I'm looking it up now. Uh, Eldest Souls. Yeah. I Was think that that's it? it. Or no, the last. That's campfire. it. Sorry, yeah, the last campfire. Oh man. And it's made by Watch yeah. His Face, Sean Murray, who's the creative director of uh, No Man's Sky, Hello Games. Of Hello Games who was, yeah. you know. I a thought weird it was PR kind guy. of a curious choice to have that guy on camera again. Yeah, they, they shouldn't let him do PR, ever. Yeah, I would have thought after everything. Um, there was stuff I really... Like, I thought this was a good direct. It got through stuff pretty sharp, and I liked that. Uh, I thought the fake banter was so fucking bad. <laughs> yeah. This game reminds me of when I was in my goth phase. <laughs> Yeah, no, oh, no, don't do that. Yep. Yeah, I was just like, oh, stop it. Like, these are good games. Like, they did a cool thing where they were, like, showing a lot of the indie indie developers on screen. And it was cool because you were seeing, like, Ar- like, Argentinian directors and, like, you know, people from places that, like, you don't get noticed a lot. And some of the games are great. I thought I Am Dead looked yeah, really cool. Yeah, it did. It's cool. got a cool mechanic as well. 
with their yep. weird x-ray um, stuff i yeah it, it's it's it, that seemed rad it's like this little fishing village neve and you have to like it's it's like i don't know what you are in it it nearly looks like you're this weird disembodied character but like you go into a room and like you know it frames the room and the camera really nicely it's got this really beautiful colorful to like flat but like 3d art style and then like you know you click on a, you go into a box and then like the box opens up but then the box fills the screen in this really interesting compositional way and i thought that looked class um, um cyanide and happiness get in the game there you Woo! go everyone everyone's favorite web comic uh, after control alt delete, yeah. obviously. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I really like course. that Italian Studio Ghibli looking game. That yeah, looked it looked great. really, really nice. And like, we have a lot of Italian friends in the animation industry, but like, they always have the best sketchbooks. So it was like looking at like your Italian animator friend's sketchbook as a game, which is all these lovely concepts fully yeah. visualized. Um, I thought moving out looked kind of cool as well. Yeah, it did. It's just a game. It, it's ba it's basically looked like uh, what's that cooking game? Um, oh, you know the four Overcooked. player one, Brian. For Overcooked, yeah. It looked like that, except you had to move out. Moving out's a nightmare. It's a really funny idea to make a video game about that. Um, and then they showed Swery's the Good Life again, and yes, that looks good. Excuse me. Um. So that officially got a Switch announcement because originally it wasn't going to come out in Switch. So it's great that it's coming out there. It feels like something that should be on. The oh Switch. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that game continues to look cool, and I'm glad it's coming out this year. But yeah, um, any final thoughts on the Nintendo Direct? Um, line? I just I think it's a very cool indie machine. The Switch. I just think it's. Uh, I'm always impressed about what appears on the eShop that you didn't know was being in development or being developed, so it's cool that they're kind of jumping ahead and just, you know, reminding us of what's coming out later this year. Sometimes I really like when an indie game drops on Switch where it's like, you just open up the market and there it is. It's like, oh, I remember this from like four yeah. years ago. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Try I this. love that feeling. I played Volger the Viking on Switch. It was good. <laughs> um... Mark Cerny describes the PS5. Yeah, uh, he and he and he describes it very well. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, so everyone's at home on their computers. Uh, what better time to get them excited about a new console that's out at the end of the year? Um, a new console where people thought there might be an announcement in February. Yes, and um, announce it the day before. Do Brian, a, uh, sorry, if I could just... Sp Brian, sorry, if could I just speed you up? Could you just get to the whatever with the games they talked oh, about? Oh, there, there were no games. There, there was nothing visually there. It was all described uh, with some kind of ambiguous uh, uh, kind of like low-poly uh, bar charts. Sorry, Brian, I don't think you understood the question. Just um, Last of Us 2, Crash 5, whatever we're fucking talking here, just whatever, whatever Mark's already talking. Knack 3? Uh, uh, like, he talked happened? about what, okay, Dead Space, which was a PlayStation 3 game. He talked about Jack 2. Uh, Dead Space no, no, 4? No, 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 no. Dead Space 1 on the PlayStation 3. He talked about Jack 2, which is on the PlayStation 2. So he okay. talked about games from about 10, 15, 20 years ago. Really good. <laughs> yeah, so... I feel like the lecture, the whatever you want to call it, the presentation itself, not, you know, not really a public facing thing as much as a game developer thing. I thought the messaging of just putting out a tweet being like, road to PlayStation 5 now. And, and doing a countdown and streaming the, it live. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Streaming it on I, YouTube and Twitch. Yeah. This, this maybe would have been a great, like, second presentation on the PlayStation 5 because so much of it was just like and like I know people are going to be saying like well they said it was going to be a technical thing not the way I saw it like I just saw the thing on my timeline and I was like cool let's fucking go and then it was that and mm -hmm. it was not and like the chat was so brutal they were just and like oh, Mark is such an important guy in Sony like he's a great asset to the company and like people didn't know who he was and so they were like who's this nerd who's who's this Dana Carvey looking guy yeah. 
The messaging was so awful because it was like, you know, GDC was cancelled and it was just like, this is kind of the information they were going to have, but they recorded it and put it out there. And that's all cool, but the messaging around it was not that at all. But even even if it was that, it was so weird. Like, this was always going to be technical and dry, but this was like so dry, it was nearly like, it felt like satire. It felt really weird. Like, the cardboard cut out, like, audience members. Like, there's just like three... <laughs> silhouetted people in front of him and they don't look like they're there you're just like are they moving is that on a loop like what is happening yeah <laughs> and, and the yeah. bit towards the end where he started talking about ears and how he was gonna like how the playstation 5 would like that... sculpt your ear and like I, I I get the idea. That one line where it was like, maybe maybe you'll take a photo of your ears and send them to us. Yeah. <laughs> like I was like, oh boy, like this is not. Oh, like, I, I I I it's very impressive that the PlayStation Five will be very easy to develop for. That that that's a huge relief, and that yeah. that the architecture is like he should be proud of that. Like he's he's a very very talented man with a very very talented team. And I'm sure the PlayStation 5 will be a fantastic system in two or three years when these games are developed for us. And hopefully the turnaround for the development won't take too long because of the great architecture. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know what to feel about this, really. Um, there was have some... you guys looked up any... Oh, sorry, John. Sorry, go you ahead. go ahead, Neve. No, you go uh, ahead. You go ahead. I was just going to say there was some, like interesting stuff in it about the ssd and about like you know play your playstation 5 games on the ssd but maybe have an external hd drive for your uh playstation 4 games and then they said that it would be the top 100 playstation 4 games that would be backwards compatible and then people were like oh so not everything playstation 4 is going to be backwards compatible which is kind of a lot of people thought that that's where this was going i mean xbox has done a really good job of backwards compatibility and i don't know where this rumor started but a lot of people have for some reason thought that this playstation 5 will not only play ps4 games but three and two and maybe Hell one no, it won't. and that's just no way that's not going to happen but it is super disappointing to hear that it's going to be like a kind of i guess a staggered thing for playstation 4 games yeah like it, it's it's not really yeah. a priority yeah. unless it's like a big system seller you know like uncharted 4 or bloodborne or something like that that's like very exclusive very like you know a playstation 4 game yeah and i think um it, it's from what i've seen with like I've seen people say before, like, that basically uh, backwards compatibility is a thing that people really want, but very few people actually play. And so I can see why it's, like, a weird proposition for games companies to invest in it. Um, I, I I had not heard that thing about the backwards compatible PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 games until after the fact. And I saw a lot of people being like, oh, it, you know, no PlayStation 1 or 2 backwards compatibility. I was kind of... I was kind of surprised. I was like, wow, is that a thing people like are still kind of looking for? Because I'd like it. Like, I'd be like, oh, cool, that's awesome. But it's definitely not something I'd expect from like, a Like, do people console. have PlayStation 1 discs that they're burning to use right now? Yeah, it's kind of weird, especially like with a lot of, like, they're clearly not going to do that. They're doing HD remakes and remasters because they sell, yeah. you know? Like, I have yeah, Final I mean, Fantasy I... VIII there on PlayStation 1. I'm not going to bring out my PlayStation 1, I'm going to buy it, the HD version on the Switch. Yeah. Like, why, like, there's profit there that they're probably going to take advantage of rather than put in backwards compatibility for a 20-year-old console. Like, unless you really, really want to play yeah. Vib Ribbon again. I'm trying to think of, like, PlayStation 1 games that are stuck on the PlayStation 1, but, like, most of them are ported. Like, even Medieval was ported last year. Like, nobody wants to play original Medieval if, the, if there's a I'd love if they, I'd love if they ported the original, or I'd love if they HD remastered the original Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, the PlayStation 1 versions. I'd be That'd really be cool. down for that. But I don't know that they would. Yeah, like, yeah. Guys, what say we take some emails? Do you want to send us an email? 
and I'd love to send in an email, but as far as I know, you guys don't have oh, we an do. address. And so I'm kind of... John, stop what? talking and start typing an email to askletsfightaboss at gmail.com. I see. Um, okay, I'm going to take this first one from Nick. Um, is wrestling art? If so, please explain. If not, thank you for respecting my time at last. Cheers, Nick. Yes, next yeah. email. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here's one. Uh, uh, okay, no, no, can we... Can, no, can we... Uh, we have we ever talked about like the whole video games art thing on this podcast? I don't know what we ever I'm have. Sure we did a while back, did we? Yeah, probably. Like, like, like something know. like Shadow of the Colossus has more credibility than like, um, you know, some parody movie. Brutal legend. Yeah, like Brutal Legend. I, I don't know. Yeah, video games art. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, to me, like art's not a statement of quality. Like. To me, everything's art. Not all art's yeah, good. So, yeah. But wrestling is the best. But wrestling is the best form. Wrestling of art. is crazy ass performance theater. Yeah, and it's as as those silent arena shows have proven. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, wrestling's totally art. It's like someone would have to explain to me how it's not. Honestly, like I just I, I don't see it. Um, Brian, why don't you take this next one from Hello Canada? Oh, hello from Canada. Okay, sure. Hello from Canada. I've been listening to you to you guys for about a year now, and I love every episode. Thank you. I wanted to tell you all about a trend I noticed between the three of you and see your opinions. Brian and John seem to be the type to mostly dip their toe into lots of games every year, and rarely get to the end of most games. Neve, on the other hand, tends to go the whole nine yards with quite a bit of games every year, even if she doesn't like them very much. I don't get that part. Question for B and J. That's Brian and John. She she be all of uh, yeah, beat Death the shit Stranding. out of it. <laughs> um, question for B and J. How often do you feel uh, disappointed that you spent money and barely used the product? I know that when I buy a game and I barely play it either because it doesn't grip me as much as I was expecting or other games gotten away, I feel bummed and like I wasted my time and our money. And the question for Neov then, well, should we answer that part first and then get to Neov's question? Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. so. Um, if I'm uncertain about a game, I'll buy it physically, uh, that way I can flip it if I don't like it, or I'll wait a year or two or until it's super cheap and then try it that way. Um, I think if I buy a game digitally and I don't like it and it's there stuck on my home menu, that's definitely a bitter feeling. Yeah, um, I only ever feel it like if it's like a 60 euro brand new game and I'm just like, oh shit, like I just don't like this at all. Um, that kind of stings, but also like, um... I would say there's very few games that, like, I don't play that much of. Like, there's there's a lot of games I won't finish, but, like, usually I'll give... Like, if I'm paying money for a game, I'm usually going to give it at least, at least, like, six or seven hours. And sometimes with the podcast, like, I might come on and be like, oh, I played two hours of this game. And then I might play, like, another four or five hours, and then I'll be done. But I just... I didn't experience anything new that I thought was worth talking about on the podcast, so I just won't bring it up again. Do you know what I mean? So maybe that makes it sound like I don't get as far into games as I do. But um, one thing I actually wanted to try and do this year was spend more time beating games, because like especially when I went through our game of the year list last year, I had nearly twice the games that you guys did, but I had completed so few. And I missed that feeling of finishing games, and so I wanted to kind of go back and finish more games. Like, this year I've already beaten a bunch of games. Like, a bunch of games from my back catalogue, like Kiwami 2 and stuff, and that's a yeah. good feeling. Uh, okay, and then the question for Neve, uh Why do you spend so much time on some games that you really don't like, uh, such as Days Gone and Death Stranding? I am more like you in the sense that I try to get the most out of games I buy, but you seem to be on a whole other level. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's, like, because I don't really hate them like I enjoy how do I put this I enjoy disliking something as much as I enjoy liking something that's true whoa 
like I find it interesting when I play something and I love it I want to play it to completion and understand why I love it and if I play something that I didn't like I really want to play it to completion just so I can understand why I don't like it or what didn't work about it for me I'm also like deathly curious that like maybe or afraid even like say with Death Stranding like I had some people telling me oh you know they explained the baby thing like later on and I was just like, oh, well, I want to get to the explanation because maybe it'll give context for this and I'll, then I'll like this a lot more with that context. Um, and that didn't happen at all. And mostly it doesn't happen. But I think as well, being someone who wants to criticize something, I feel like if I'm going to be critical about a game, I kind of have to give it its dues. Like I have to try and experience as much of uh, it as possible so I can really be like, no, they don't actually explore that, or they do explore that, but I don't think it was done particularly well. And I feel like there might be this, like, even if it's just microscopic, but there might be this this tiny thing I left out that could give context, that could change my opinion on something. Either way, I kind of want to give it the chance. But generally, I have as much fun with a game I dislike as a game I like. Like, when I was playing Death Stranding, I was going between Ah, oh, yay, I'm having fun to, oh, this is really, you're, you're ticking me off, Kojima. Like, I don't ever n want Kojima to not make games. I want him to make games forever, and I want to love them and hate them. You know, they're eliciting an emotional response from me, and I like that, whether it's good or bad, you know? It's like watching a crap movie. It's kind of like, there's something fun about it. And I, I know sometimes people be like, but it's 80 hours, not two hours. <laughs> um, and if I really do just I'm finding no joy in something, I will drop it. But like with Days Gone, you know, it was mostly miserable. But honestly, the start of it was more miserable and the end was more fun. I wanted to see how that story would play out. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I feel like. Like, what's the point of going 80 percent on something and then kind of dropping it at that at that point? For me, I'd feel more frustrated at myself if I dropped it. I feel like I'd wasted more time by dropping it than by finishing and just putting a little tick mark next to it and being like, that's done. You know, I never have to think about it again. I never have to look back on it. It's it's done. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, as someone who drops a lot of games, there are games that kind of haunt me. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, should I? Mm, but then there's, there's some stuff like, like if a game becomes just where I where I have to convince myself to play it, I know that's it. Like, I know I'm just kind of done from from there. So, yeah, it's a weird balancing act, and I think everyone's kind of different. I do think you're right, though, about, like, there being value in playing a game that you're not necessarily enjoying. Like, um, I'm getting a bit of that with, like, Darksiders 3. Like, it's like, wow, this action really isn't hitting home with me. Why is that? And yeah. trying to, like, piece together why that's not working for you. I think that's a really kind of fun experience to have. I think like, you know, we're, we do this podcast, we're kind of part-time critics, we're not professionals in any case, but I kind of do like to explore why I have these feelings and to try and figure out why, and you know, that usually involves finishing the whole thing. But then again, I'm not one of these people who thinks you have to finish a game to have an opinion on it at all. Just for me, I like to, I like to do that. Yeah. Yeah. We got a question for the yeah, whole gang. Uh, here. Question for the whole gang. Uh, what games do you most wish to have a real sequel? No spiritual successor stuff. And then he and then says here. Uh, for me, there are two. I want another Pokémon tournament, a very fun, a very unique and fun fighting game that I think deserves a larger fan base. And the second would be another retro studio Donkey Kong, either a third 2D platformer or their take on Donkey Kong 64. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, I think yeah. uh, I would like to see Octopath Traveler 2. I I think they have a good basis for something there that just did not hit that landing for a lot of people. Um, but I really liked that team and I really liked how that looked and what they were trying to go for. So I would love to see them do do a 2 and, you know, expand on everything they learned. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'd love a Pikmin 4. Uh, Pikmin 3 came out in 2013. That was seven years ago. Um, I would really, really like to see a Pikmin on the Switch. There's so many games that use that kind of like 
uh, small scale tilt shift aesthetic to them now with like Link's Awakening remake and and the new a a a Animal Crossing has it as well where everything looks really, really nice and out of focus. They all look like toys. I think they could really, really do something special with Pikmin 4. And I think Nintendo should make it. They should give it out to some other second party developer like Retro or another Western studio like that. Just, just to see their take on a franchise like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I think the two big and like it's not like I think these need a sequel because like I'm satisfied with what's out there. I'd love Mother Four. Um, I'd, I'd kill for Mother Four. That'd be great. Um, but you'd have to get the main. You know that you know the way you were saying about like farming yeah. out, Brian. To me, like that dude has Itoi. to be Itoi. Shigesato like, Itoi. Yeah. Yeah, like that series is him, and I don't think it works without him. And then it would be the opposite for me with Silent Hill. Um, give it out to some weird studio, like let them have a shot with it, uh, you know. Although, do you guys see there like those rumors getting heavier and heavier that it's yeah. like yeah, Kojima's working? Uh, <laughs> There's that, two. Like, sure, let, let's yeah. do that. <sighs> yeah, like sure, you know, I. I I'd love to see Silent Hill back in whatever form, and maybe it'll suck, but like that's that's the kind of roll of the dice with this stuff. So yeah. Um, one more that I'll throw in there. Uh, I'd love to see the Clock Tower series come back in some way. Um, you Was know, the last one of those games the PlayStation Two one. Yeah. Wow. That's such a cool game. I feel like it's like ripe for kind of a reboot or a return, and like since like Resident Evil is doing so well, and I feel like there's like. You know, people want some more horror games. I feel like the Clock Tower series might be a good one to bring back. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, did you ever play that? Was it Project Scissors? Was that what it was called? Hmm. What's Project Scissors? Some of the staff, some of the staff from Silent Hill and Clock Tower made a Kickstarter for a weird horror game, and you're on a boat, and a man with giant scissors chases you. Wow. No, I've never heard of this. Neve, I think you told me about this. Right? <gasps> oh. Yeah, it looks. Yes, I know what this is. Project huh. Scissors. I haven't played it. Anyway, uh, this email was from Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you so Thanks, much, Chris. Chris. Uh, Neve, why don't you take this last one on Conor McGregor? Because, because it is St. Patrick's Day week, and you know we gotta we gotta do something Irish. That's the only time of year you can ask us about Irish things. The only time. Okay. I have a question about fighting for you guys. So John has mentioned that he started practicing BJ's and a <laughs> while ago. Do you still practice, John? Sorry. Question mark. Uh, if you do, I really recommend the documentary Choke. <laughs> <laughs> it's about. <laughs> wow. That, that really lined up for you, didn't it? Yeah, man? I love it. It almost does. Uh, it's about Ricks and, yeah, Ricks and Gracie, and I guess it's on YouTube, Smiley Face. And also, do any of you guys know about Conor McGregor? He has a fight near the end of January, I think. I know he is from Dublin. I'm pretty sure he's known around the world. He's done some bad stuff lately, but he's surely an awesome fighter. Any thoughts on him or MMA at all? Thank you. You have a good one. Uh, who is this from? <laughs> I don't know. It's from, it's oh. from you, listener. Uh, I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can pull up a name. Uh, yeah, we know about Conor McGregor. Ireland's really small. If anyone achieves anything, you kind of hear about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we're all very, very aware of Conor McGregor. Um, I think, I don't know, I was like, yeah, Conor McGregor. Like, he's cool. And then he became very not cool very quickly and just became... He just very, like, yeah. very quickly. He's just a dick. Like, he just seems like a big dickhead. He's just... A big stupid he's, dickhead. He's a what? fucking embarrassment at this point in terms of international distribution yeah. of an Irish person. Like he's worse than Bono, like to me. Just he, yeah. he's, he's just an embarrassment. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like, um, like at best he's kind of an asshole, but at worst, like there's some real fucking salacious information that goes out about him, and just like really awful things he's done. And like I hate the way 
he carries on. I hate the way he fights. I think he's a... F well, I don't hate the way he fights. Like, I hate the way he builds up to a fight and the way he's constantly taunting his opponents and all that kind of stuff. And, like, the way he digs into their past and finds, like, the most hurtful shit he can just to save mm. them at the press conference. And, like, okay, like, it's all for... Sh you could say it's all for show or whatever, but, like... It fucking sucks. Like, if I fought someone like that in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu who is like trying to get personal, and granted, this is just like, you know, a shitty gym or a gym that I go to, there's nothing on the line. But that's so against what martial arts are to me and why I do them, and I can't stand the guy. And like, yeah, he's good at fighting, but like, fuck him, he's a terrible person, and that trumps that yeah. To, yeah. Me, to no ends. There's a lot of people who are very good at fighting and are, you know, good sports about it, you know? Yeah and Conor McGregor just isn't. I think, like, there's been a lot of shit that he's done has just turned me off, but seeing him hit that owl lad in the pub for not wanting to drink his shit whiskey was just one of those, oh, fuck you, you're so gross. Yeah, that, that was... that was gross anyway, one. but that was just, like, slapping an owl guy because you don't want... He, he doesn't want to drink your drink. Did you did, did you guys see the photo? Like, if you've, if you've heard the... No, no, go on. Sorry, just... Um, if, if you've heard, like, some of the shit that goes out about Conor McGregor, like, there's some pretty... You know, pretty horrific claims been brought against them. Like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept a drink from him either. You know, sorry, um, what I'm gonna say. When people were panic buying last week, they were buying up all the liquor. You know, for St. Patrick's Day as well, and nobody is buying his whiskey. It's just like fully stocked on the shelves, <laughs> ah! beside like empty Jameson like shelves and stuff like that. I think that's very funny. Um, he he was like cool for a hot minute back in like 2015, 2016, but then like the more he was out in the public, the more embarrassed you were about him. And now he's just like, I don't like him being brought up. If you go on holidays, they're like, oh, do you watch Conor McGregor fights? You're just like, no, not really. Like, I really like before when Seamus the Wrestler was getting big and you'd go on holidays to New York or something and they'd be like, oh, you're Irish, like Seamus the Wrestler. And you'd be like, yeah. Like yeah, Becky exactly. Yeah, Becky, Becky Lynch, Lynch is cool. awesome, but like Conor, Conor McGregor is not. If it, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we want to talk about good Irish sports, like um, like in that field of like fighting, like Katie Taylor. Yeah, Katie Taylor is great. Yeah, class guys. Let's say we do some Patreon shoutouts. Oh yeah, here we go. There's a website on the internet called Patreon.com forward slash lfab did you know that bet you know now oh sorry brian um why are you bringing up a random website like what what does this have to do because with if you join it if you pledge three dollars or more you can join our discord server where there's a bunch of cool dudes hanging out saying night get the and fuck like, out are this you is serious the only place on the internet i've ever been to where people are nice to each other like lovely lovely it's, people yeah. Like, I, Neve, can you verify any of this? Um, I, I think those guys are uh, uh, evil little gnomes, and I don't enjoy them whatsoever. Neve, you've got to break their hearts. <laughs> Neve, you're kind of you're kind of stealing my bit here. Uh, I'm sorry. No, I love our evil little gnomes. Uh, I think they're great. <laughs> they're they're what keeps the podcast going. They're just cranking the little shifts in the the internet machine. Uh, on our Discord, <laughs> and they make the podcast so, run. <laughs> if you would like to be a little gnome cranking the gears that is the Let's Fight a Boss podcast, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash LFAB, where you can also have a message read out, just like our friend here, Gliver Soul, who says, Henshin a go go, baby. There you go. Uh, I'll, I'll take the next one. It's from uh, Chocolope. And Chocolope says, Forklift Chan is best girl. And this is from, I presume that's a Shinmu oh, reference. Yeah. And this is from Brigadoon, uh, Marin, and. <laughs> Say it. Go for it. <laughs> Say it, Eve. Zatupi. There you go, everyone. Zatupi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for keeping me company during my Persona 2 playthrough. Wow. No problem, Zatopi. Persona 2. That's amazing. Um, and just to put out there, guys, thank you so much for giving to the Patreon. We are so close to our um, Shenmue 2 Let's Play. J Brian is just quaking in his boots, and John is quaking too in other ways. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it, Shenmue 2 
do you feel how hyped Brian, I am? I, Brian, I feel like you and Shenmue kind of got off on, we'll say, the wrong yeah. foot. But um, I really genuinely think, like, I'm not even joking, this isn't a bit, I genuinely think Shenmue 2 is going to turn you around. Do you think, like, after I play two minutes of Shenmue 2, I will, like, throw my chibi robo amiibo off the balcony? You will. You'll be like, Kirby? More like, fuck boy. Hey. I, I'm only saying what I know like, to Do you be think true. I'll be like Banjo Kazooie was what? always bad and Shenmue is the greatest thing ever? Do you think I'll be like that kind of guy? 100%. I, absolutely. I, I refuse to believe this, but what could be a possibility is only determined by you, our dear audience. Do you see what I did there? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Patreon.com forward slash LFAB. Guys, let's say we do some loot drops. Yes, we're at the end of the show. We got some cool shit to give to you all. Uh, what mm-hmm. do you guys have? Um, well, Brian, why don't you go first, and we will we will. Okay, get so right what's happened is me and John moment. don't have anything prepared. Brian, it's a pandemic. It's a yeah, goddamn you've been pandemic. Consuming so okay? much media. Would you not just like you know recommend one of them? Okay, I'll go first. I have. Okay, I have. mine is a YouTube channel called uh, Trash Theory. I think I loot dropped this channel before, but they have a video on Firestarter by the Prodigy, and it's just about their kind of uprising to fame with the song Firestarter and the album The Fat of the Land, which is one of my favorite albums ever, and just kind of them winning over the hard rock audience, even though they're dance music. But just them kind of mixing the two genres together into something really fucking hard and fresh back in 1995. And it kind of goes into the production of the music video because that music video is so iconic. And just kind of how the Prodigy started off as a solo project with two hype guys that then kind of became a full, fully fledged band with a band leader and two very cool MCs. I like the Prodigy. And it's been one year since Keith Flint died and... Uh, I still go on his Wikipedia page maybe every month or two just to look at the Wikipedia, Wikipedia photo that they have for him because it's like the best fucking photo ever of a human. Keith Flint's cool. Yeah, very. Um, I got one called The Tragic Story Behind the Worst Fantasy Book Ever. Um, this is from a channel called Dominic Noble. And it's basically this this really infamous fantasy book called The Eye of Argon. And it's just meant to be terrible for, like, just all the really cliched reasons that writings are terrible. It's like a self-insert book. It's rife with spelling. The plot is really awful. And it's been, like, ridiculed for years and years and years. But this video is actually kind of about how basically the person who wrote the book never meant it for publication and how he basically got shafted out of the publishing rights and never made any money off it and his like basically the, it just the whole experience just destroyed his, any like fondness he had for writing and um it's really sad and i think it's it's a good like it's a good one for making you think about like how the internet kind of treats this kind of stuff and like at some point where it all kind of crosses a line and I just thought it was a really good it was a really good video and Dominic Nobles it's a it's a good channel he's like a book reviewer booktube is apparently a thing oh uh, yeah I didn't wow. know that I love, yeah. re- I love booktube it's good do you know what I've kind of been looking into a bit lately like artist YouTube like people who illustrate on YouTube and they all fucking hate <laughs> each other yeah show like, some support passionately I, I like it's like it's like a drama community except like except sometimes people draw like that's what it's like oh, come on lads yeah. how about you Neve? okay Neve, what do you got okay gonna just blow all your minds with this one capybara with mandarin orange on head in open air bath i've seen this it's fucking brilliant it's just some capybaras hanging out in and in a Japanese open air bath, they're having a nice time. I think it's what we all need right now. I really like capybaras. Absolutely. 
They're so cute. Yeah, they're, they're just cool. giant yeah. guinea pigs. The world's largest, largest rodent. What's one of your favorite, like, what's your favorite kind of, like, not traditional animal? Ooh. Um, what is, I think the monkey, it, it, it's kind of like a cross between a monkey and a rodent. I think it's called an eye eye. But it's the one that has the very oh. long middle finger that it uses to tap and then like oh. fish out like insects. That is an eye eye. They're yeah, very they're good. Yeah, they're such an interesting animal. They kind of spook. Yeah, me exactly. A bit. Like they're like I I'd be so scared to meet one in real life, but like I find them fascinating. Um, I'm a same 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 with. I'm a big fan oh, sorry, of platypuses. Yeah. Platypuses are super cute. Um, yeah, um, because I think for ages. I was like, oh, platypuses are just like a thing that are in cartoons. Like, they're not real. Because how could they be? And then I, I looked up a picture of one in a book and I was like, holy shit, yeah. they are real. Sorry, I, I, I also like say. Japanese spider crabs. They are aliens that we can see. It is true. Yes. I'm going to shout out a wombat. Love a wombat. They're very cute. Brilliant. They're just a huggable... Some animals yep. to add to our fact files of Let's Fight a Boss. Well, wombats are big. <laughs> yeah, aren't they? It's like a rodent or this person, dog. Or this person is tiny. Could be both. Um, and guys, I think that's going to do it for this very special quarantine episode of Let's Fight a Boss. I don't know about you guys. I found this fucking hard. Yeah. Very yes, hard. It was so weird and so hard. I hope it sounds okay, guys. We, me and Brian have never done anything like this before. Um, I know Brian and John has a bit of experience, but just the three of us, we've never communicated this. Way and before. I guess for a lot of us, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, never... <laughs> we just keep interrupting. Sorry, that shit, yeah. that kind of shit, where it's like we're on one second delay, and so we and like we can't see each other's faces. So that oh man, it's so weird. We're gonna yeah, get better at this. We are. Going um, to get I, I guess for me, it's well is that like we're all at home with our partners, and we and like we're uh, talking away to them. But I think it's been a few days since we've had more than a few words with someone else. So it's it's very easy mm-hmm. to forget how to talk to people. Yeah. So we're just awkward yeah. and flustered, weird, and but... it shows. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And but like I mean, I think that's just that's what this was going to be, you know what I mean? And it's like we'll get better at it cuz like yeah. It's just when when you sp- when you build up like build up like 120 episodes of people and you're working a very specific way, it feels so weird yeah. working another way. We can only get stronger. We can only get stronger. It's just use your strength as physical and now we must make it digital. <sighs> digital strength. Can you hack it? Strength. How many bits? Absolutely no. Not. Oh, okay. How many bits do you have in your bite? Okay, <laughs> okay. Right. Ten bits. Can you per crunch bite. that tech hard? Can you can you blast that package into a new VPN? Can you open access this motherfucker wide open? Can you can you inhale? I'm can you this. inhale bricks and exhale train rails? That's a line from a song. Can you can you uh, can you punch a glitch? Can you can you can? I'm I'm finding this both motivational okay. and erotic. viruses, computer viruses. We we've got the fucking cure. We're gonna fucking annihilate this shit. We're we we are all gonna overcome it with our with our digital bodies. We're all gonna upload ourselves and fuck shit up. You know what I'm saying? Goodbye, everyone. Stay safe out there. Bye, everyone. Wash your hands. Yeah, please do wash your hands. Goodbye. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop recording.